This is Audible. Hard Bitten, a Chicago Land Vampires novel, by Chloe Neal, narrated by Cynthia Holloway. Copyright 2011 by Chloe Neal. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with NAL Signet, a member of Penguin Group USA Incorporated, and was produced in the year 2011 by Tantor Media Incorporated. Which holds the copyright there too. Chapter One: Magic is as magic does. Late August, Chicago, Illinois. We worked beneath the shine of floodlights that punched holes in the darkness of Hyde Park. Nearly one hundred vampires airing rugs, painting cabinet doors, and sanding trim. A handful of severe-looking men in black. Extra mercenary fairies we'd hired for protection stood outside the fence that formed a barrier between the block's wide grounds of Cadogan House and the rest of the city. In part, they were protecting us from a second attack by shapeshifters. That seemed unlikely, but so had the first onslaught, led by the youngest brother of the leader of the North American Central Pack. Unfortunately, that hadn't stopped Adam Keen. They were also protecting us from a new threat: humans. I glanced up from the elegant curve of wooden trim I was swabbing with stain. It was nearly midnight, but the golden glow of the protesters' candles was visible through the gap in the fence. Their flames flickered in the sticky summer breeze. Three or four dozen humans making their quiet objections to the vampires in their city. Popularity was a fickle thing. Chicagoans had rioted when we'd come out of the closet nearly a year ago. Fear had eventually given way to awe, complete with paparazzi and glossy magazine spreads. But the violence of the attack on the house, and the fact that we'd fought back and, in doing so, had thrown shifters out into the open, had turned the tides again. Humans hadn't been thrilled to learn we existed, and if werewolves were out there too, what else lurked in the shadows? For the past couple of months, we'd seen raw, ugly prejudice from humans who didn't want us in their neighborhood and camped outside of the house to make sure we were aware of it. My cell phone vibrated in my pocket. I flipped it open and answered, "Merritt's House of Carpentry." Mallory Carmichael, my best friend in the world and a sorceress in her own right, snorted from the other end. Kind of dangerous, isn't it? Being a vampire around all those would-be aspen stakes. I looked over the trim on the sawhorse in front of me. I'm not sure any of this is actually aspen, but I take your point. I assume from the intro that carpentry is on your agenda again this evening. You would be correct. Since you asked, I'm applying stain to some lovely woodwork. After which I'll probably apply a little sealant. Oh my God, yawn! She interrupted, "Please spare me your hardware stories. I'd offer to come entertain you, but I'm heading to Schomburg. Magic is as magic does, and all that." That explained the rumbling of the car in the background on her end. Actually, Mal, even if you could make it, we're a human-free abode right now. No shit," she said. When did Dar Sullivan issue that dictate? When Mayor Tate asked him to, Mallory let out a low whistle, and her voice was equally concerned. Seriously, Catcher didn't even say anything about that. Catcher was Mallory's current live-in boyfriend, the sorcerer who'd replaced me when I made the move to Cadogan House a few months ago. He also worked in the office of the city's supernatural ombudsman, my grandfather, and was supposed to be in the know about all things supernatural. The ombudsman's office was a kind of paranormal help desk. The houses are keeping it on the down low. I admitted. Word gets out that Tate closed the houses, and people panic because they think vampires pose a real threat to humans. Exactly. And speaking of real threats, what are you learning tonight in Schomburg? Har har, my little vampire friend. You will love and fear me in due time. I already do. Are you still doing potions? Actually, no. We're doing some different stuff this week. How's the head honcho? 
The quick change of subject was a little weird. Mallory usually loved an interested audience when it came to the paranormal and her magic apprenticeship. Maybe the stuff she was learning now was actually as dull as carpentry, although that was hard to imagine. Ethan Sullivan is still Ethan Sullivan, I finally concluded. She snorted in agreement. And I assume he always will be, being immortal and all. But some things do change. Speaking of, and how's that for a segue? Guess who's now got a big old pair of spectacles perched on the end of his perfect little nose? Joss Whedon? Although it had taken her a little while to get used to the idea of having magic, Mal had always had a thing for the supernatural, fiction or otherwise. Buffy and Spike were particular objects of affection. Gad, no. Although, wouldn't that totally give me an excuse to pop into the Whedon verse and, like, magically correct his eyesight or something? Anywho, no. Catcher. I grinned. Catcher got glasses? Mr. I'm so suave I shaved my head even though I wasn't balding got glasses? Maybe this is going to be a good night after all. I know, right? To be fair, they actually look pretty good on him. I did offer to work a little abracadabra and hook him up with 2020, but he declined. Because? She deepened her voice into a pretty good imitation. Because that would be a selfish use of magic, expending the will of the universe on my retinas. That does sound like something he'd say. Yep, so glasses it is. And I'll tell you, they are little miracle workers. We have definitely turned a corner in the bedroom. It's like he's a new person. I mean, his sexual energy level is just off the... Mallory, enough. My ears are beginning to bleed. Prude. A piercing honk rang through the phone, followed by Mallory's voice. Learn to merge, people. Come on. Okay, I've got Wisconsin drivers in front of me, and I have to get off the phone. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Night, Mal. Good luck with the drivers and the magic. Smooches she said, and the line went dead. I tucked the phone back into my pocket. Thank God for besties. Ten minutes later, I had a chance to test my Ethan is still Ethan theory. I didn't even need to glance back to know that he'd stepped behind me. The rising chill along my spine was indication enough. Ethan Sullivan, master of Cadogan House, the vampire who'd added me to its ranks. After two months of wooing, Ethan and I had spent a pretty glorious night together, but together hadn't lasted. He'd reverse course after he decided dating me was an emotional risk he couldn't afford to take. He'd regretted that decision, too, and he'd spent the past two months attempting, or so he said, to make amends. Ethan was tall, blonde, and almost obscenely handsome from the long, narrow nose to the sculpted cheekbones and emerald green eyes. He was also smart and dedicated to his vampires, and he'd broken my heart. Two months later, I could accept that he'd feared our relationship would put his house at risk. It would have been a lie to say I didn't feel the attraction, but that didn't make me any less eager for a rematch, so I was warily standing my ground. Sentinel he said, using the title he'd given me. A house guard of sorts. They're surprisingly quiet tonight. They are, I agreed. We'd had a few days of loud chants, picket signs, and bongo drums until protesters realized we weren't aware of the noises they made during the day. And the denizens of Hyde Park would tolerate noise after nightfall for only so long. Score one for Hyde Park. Makes for a nice change. How are things out here? We're moving along, I said, wiping away an errant drip of stain. But I'll be glad when we're done. I don't think construction is my bag. I'll keep that in mind for future projects. I could hear the amusement in his voice. After taking a second to check my willpower, I looked over at him. Tonight, Ethan wore jeans and a paint-smeared T-shirt, and his shoulder-length golden hair was pulled back at the nape of his neck. His dress might have been casual, but there was no mistaking the air of power and unfailing confidence that marked this prince among vampires. 
Hands on his hips, he surveyed his crew. Men and women worked at tables and sawhorses across the front lawn. His emerald gaze tracked from worker to worker as he gauged their progress, but his shoulders were tense, as if he was ever aware that danger lurked just outside the gate. Ethan was no less handsome in jeans and running shoes while taking stock of his vampiric kin. How are things inside? I asked. Moving along, albeit slowly. Things would go faster if we were allowed to bring in human construction workers. Not bringing them in does save us the risk of human sabotage, I pointed out. And the risk that a drywall contractor becomes a snack, he mused. But when he looked back at me again, a line of worry appeared between his eyes. What is it? I prompted. Ethan offered up his signature move, a single arched eyebrow. Well, obviously, other than the protesters and constant threat of attack, I said. Tate called. He asked for a meeting with the two of us. This time, I was the one who raised my eyebrows. Seth Tate, Chicago's second-term mayor, generally avoided mingling with the city's three master vampires. What does he want to meet about? This, I assume, he said, gesturing toward the protesters. Do you think he wants to meet with me because he and my father are friends? Or because my grandfather works for him? That, or because the mayor may, in fact, be smitten with you? I rolled my eyes, but couldn't stop the warm blush that rose on my cheeks. He isn't smitten with me. He just likes being re-elected. He's smitten. Not that I can't understand the emotion. And he hasn't even seen you fight yet. Ethan's voice was sweet, hopeful. Hard to ignore. For weeks he'd been this attentive, this flattering. That was not to say he didn't have his moments of snark. He was still Ethan, after all. Still a master vampire with a house full of novitiates who didn't always please him. And to add insult to injury... He was nearing the end of a months-long rehab of that house. Construction didn't always go quickly in Chicago, and it moved even more slowly when the subject of the construction was a three-story den of vampires. An architectural gem of a den, sure, but still a den of night-walking bloodsuckers, blah, blah, blah. Our human suppliers were often reticent to help, and that didn't exactly thrill Ethan. The construction notwithstanding, Ethan was doing all the right things, making all the right moves. Problem was, he'd shaken my trust. I hoped to find my own happily ever after, but I wasn't yet prepared to trust that this particular Prince Charming was ready to ride off into the sunset. Two months later, the hurt and humiliation was still too real, the wound too raw. I wasn't naive enough to deny what was between me and Ethan, or the possibility that fate would bring us together again. After all, Gabriel Keene, the head of the North American Central Pack, had somehow shared with me a vision about a pair of green eyes that looked like Ethan's, but weren't. I know, what the hell, had been my reaction, too. I wanted to believe him. Just like every other girl in America, I'd read the books and seen the movies in which the boy realizes he made a horrible decision and comes back again. I wanted to believe that Ethan mourned the loss of me, that his regret was real, and that his promises were earnest. But this wasn't a game. And as Mallory had pointed out, wouldn't it have been better if he had wanted me from the beginning? In the meantime, while I weighed the new Ethan against the old Ethan, I played the dutiful sentinel. Keeping things professional gave me the space and boundaries I needed. And it had the added benefit of irritating him. Immature? Sure. But who didn't take the opportunity to tweak their boss when they had the chance? Besides, most vampires were members of one house or another, and I was immortal. I couldn't exactly sidestep working with Ethan without damning myself to an eternity spent as an outcast. That meant I had to make the best of the situation. Avoiding the intimacy in his voice, I smiled politely at him. Hopefully he won't need to see me fight. If I'm brawling in front of the mayor, things have definitely gone south. When do we leave? 
Ethan was quiet long enough that I looked over at him, saw the earnestness in his expression. It plucked my heartstrings to see him look so decided about me. But whatever fate might have in store for us down the road, I wasn't taking that exit today. Sentinel? There was gentle reprobation in his voice, but I was sticking to my plan. Yes, Leash? Be stubborn if you wish to, if you need to. But we know how this will end. I kept my face blank. It will end as it always does, with your being master and my being sentinel. The reminder of our positions must have done it. As abruptly as he'd turned on the charm, Ethan turned it off again. Be downstairs in twenty minutes. Wear your suit. And then he was gone striding purposefully up the stairs and back into Cadogan House. I swore quietly. That boy was going to be the death of me. Chapter 2. A Fistful of Vampires Leaving Cadogan House used to be a bit of a trick, mostly involving avoiding the irritation of the paparazzi on the corner who were waiting to snap our pictures. Now it was actually dangerous. We were both in black suits official Cadogan wear, and in Ethan's black Mercedes convertible, a slick roadster he parked in the basement beneath the house. We drove up the ramp that led to the ground level, then waited while one of the ferries stationed at the gate pushed it open. A second stood in front of the ramp, his wary gaze on the protesters who were beginning to move in our direction. We pulled onto the street, the ferry at the gate closed it again, then joined his partner at the side of the car. We moved at a crawl as humans began to gather around us, candles in hand. They moved without sound, their expressions blank, like zombie believers. Their silence was completely unnerving. That was worse, I think, than if they'd been shouting anti-vampire epithets or obscenities. Apparently they've seen us, Ethan muttered, left hand on the steering wheel, right on the gear shift. Yes, they have. Do you want me to get out? As much as I appreciate the offer, let's let the fairies handle it. As if on cue, the fairies took point, one at each door. We pay them, right? For the security? We do, Ethan said. Although as they detest humans even more than they detest us, it's probably a task they'd have taken on for free. So fairies hated vampires, but hated humans more. Some humans hated vampires, and, if they'd known what the fairies were, probably would have hated them, too. And vampires? Well, vampires were like politicians. We wanted to be friends with everyone. We wanted to be liked. We wanted political capital we could trade later for political benefits. But we were still vampires, and however political and social we might have been, we were still different. Well, most of us, anyway. Ethan often remarked that I was more human than most, probably because I'd been a vampire for only a few months. But looking out at the protesters, I felt a little more vampire than usual. The protesters stared into the windows, holding their candles toward the car as if nearness to the flame was enough to make us disappear. Luckily, fire was no more hazardous to us than it was to humans. Ethan kept both hands on the wheel now as he carefully maneuvered the Mercedes through the crowd. We crawled forward one foot at a time, the humans swarming in a cloud so thick we couldn't see the road ahead. The fairies walked alongside, one hand on the roof of the petite roadster like members of the Secret Service in a presidential motorcade. We moved slowly, but we moved. And as we moved, we passed two teenagers who stood on my side of the car, arms linked together, a boy and a girl. They were so young, and they were dressed in shorts and tank tops like they'd spent the day at the beach. But their expressions told a different story. There was hatred in their eyes, hatred too intense for sixteen-year-olds. The girl had smeared mascara beneath her eyes as if she'd been crying. The boy watched the girl. His hatred for me may be prompted by his infatuation with her. With jarring suddenness, they began to chant together, No more vampires! No more vampires! No more vampires! Over and over again, they cried out the mantra, zealotry in their voices, like angels ready to smite. 
They're so young to be so angry, I quietly said. Anger isn't merely for the old, Ethan pointed out. Even the young can face misery, tragedy, and twist sadness into hatred. The rest of the crowd seemed to find the teenagers inspiring. One person at a time, they echoed the chant until the entire crowd had joined in. A chorus of hatred. Get out of our neighborhood, shouted a human close to the car, a thin woman of fifty or sixty with long gray hair, who wore a white t-shirt and khaki pants. Go back to where you came from! I faced forward again. I'm from Chicago, I murmured, born and bred. I believe they had a more supernatural dominion in mind, Ethan said. Hell, perhaps, or some parallel dimension inhabited solely by vampires and werewolves, and, in any event, far from humans. Or they want us in Gary instead of Chicago. Or that, he allowed. I forced myself to face forward, blocking out the sight of their faces at the window. Wishing I could will myself invisible, or somehow merge into the leather upholstery and avoid the discomfort of listening to humans scream about how much they hated me. It hurt, more than I would have thought possible, to be surrounded by people who didn't know me, but who would have been more than happy to hear I was gone and no longer polluting their neighborhood. It gets easier, Ethan said. I don't want it to get easier. I want to be accepted for who I am. Unfortunately, not everyone appreciates your finer qualities. But there are those of us who do. We passed a family, father, mother, and two young sons, holding a hand-painted sign that read, Hyde Park Hates Vamps. Now that, Ethan grumbled, I have little patience for. Until the children are old enough to reach their own conclusions about vampires, they should be immune from the discussion. They certainly should not have to bear the weight of their parents' prejudices. I nodded and crossed my arms over my chest, tucking into myself. After a hundred feet, the protesters thinned out, the urge to berate us apparently diminishing as we moved farther from the house. My spirit deflated, we headed northeast toward Creeley Creek, which sat in Chicago's historic Prairie Avenue neighborhood. I glanced over at Ethan. Have we thought about a campaign or something to address the hatred? Public service announcements or get-to-know-you forums? Anything to help them realize we aren't the enemy? He smirked. Our social chair at work again? As punishment for challenging Ethan to a fight, although I'd been suffering from a bit of split vampire personality at the time, Ethan had named me House Social Chair. He thought it a fitting punishment for a girl who spent more time in her room than getting to know her fellow vampires. I'll admit I was a bookworm. I'd been an English lit grad student before I was changed. But I'd been making inroads. Of course, the shifter attack had put a damper on my plans for a barbecue social mixer. I'm just a novitiate vampire trying to make it through the night with a little less hatred. Seriously, it might be something to consider. Julia's on it. Julia? House Director of Marketing and Public Relations. Huh, I hadn't even known we had one of those. Maybe we could hold a lottery for one of the initiate spots next year, I suggested. Get humans interested in being a Cadogan vampire? I've got a golden ticket, Ethan began to sing, then chuckled. Something like that. Of course, if you open up a spot to the public... You probably increase the odds of adding a saboteur to the house. And I think we're rather full in the saboteur department lately. Thinking of the two traitorous vamps the house had lost since I joined, I nodded. Wholeheartedly agreed. I should have knocked on wood, offered up a little protection against the jinx I'd caused talking about sabotage, because it suddenly looked like the protesters had called ahead. Our headlights bounced off two SUVs that were parked diagonally in the middle of the street. Six hefty men in front of them, all wearing black t-shirts and cargo pants. Hold on, Ethan yelled out, pulling the steering wheel with a screech of burning rubber. The roadster banked to the right, spinning clockwise until we sat perpendicular to the SUVs. I looked up. 
Three of the men jogged around us, guns at their waists, surrounding the car before Ethan could pull away from the roadblock. I am not crazy about this situation, I muttered. Me either, Ethan said, pulling out his cell phone and tapping keys. I assumed he was requesting backup, which was fine by me. Military? I asked Ethan, my heart beating wildly. It's unlikely official military would approach us this way, not when there are significantly easier means with less potential collateral damage. Whatever else they are, I assume they're anti-vamp. Two of the three men in front of the car unholstered their weapons, approached us, and pulled open the doors. Out, they said in unison. I took mental inventory. I had my dagger, but not my sword. I hoped I wouldn't need it. Anti-vamp indeed, Ethan muttered, then slowly lifted his hands into the air. I did the same. Steady, Sentinel, he telepathically told me. Say nothing aloud unless it's absolutely necessary. You're the boss, I replied. All evidence to the contrary. The words were silent, but the snark was obvious. We stepped outside onto the dark Chicago street, the vibration in the air, the buzz of steel I could feel after my katana had been tempered with blood, was intense. These guys, whoever they were, were well armed. Our hands in the air, their weapons trained on our hearts, we were escorted in front of the Mercedes. As vampires, we healed quickly enough that bullets wouldn't generally do us in. An aspen stake to the heart, however, would do the trick without question. Now that I thought about it, their guns didn't exactly look off the rack. They looked like custom units, with muzzles a little wider than those in the house's arsenal. Is it possible to modify a gun to shoot aspen stakes? I asked Ethan. I prefer not to find out, he replied. My stomach churned with nerves. I'd become used to the fact that my job called for violence usually perpetrated by crazy paranormals against me and mine. But these weren't paranormals. These were gun-wielding humans who apparently believed they were beyond the reach of the law, who believed that they had the authority to stop us and hold us at gunpoint within the bounds of our own city. The third man in front of us, big and bulky, with acne-marked skin and a military haircut, stepped forward. Watch him, echoed Ethan's voice in my head. Hard to miss a human tank heading right for me. You think we don't know what you're doing to our city? Tank asked. You're killing us. Sneaking around in the night, pulling us from our beds, enticing us, then drinking us down until there's nothing left. My chest tightened at his words. I certainly hadn't done any of those things. Nor did I know of any other vampires who had. At least not since Selena de Solonay. Chicago's vampire bad girl had disappeared from the scene. But Tank seemed very convinced he was telling the truth. I've done nothing to you, I told him. I've never met you, and you don't know anything about me except that I'm a vampire. Bitch, he muttered. But he snapped his head back when the rear door opened on the left-hand SUV. Two booted feet hit the pavement, followed by another man in the same black uniform. Unlike the others, this one was handsome, with long, wide eyes and high, pert cheekbones, his dark hair perfectly parted. His hands behind his back, he walked toward us while Tank closed the SUV's door. I guess the new guy was the one in charge. Mr. Sullivan, Ms. Merritt, he said. And you are? Ethan asked. The new guy smiled grandly. You can call me... McKetrick. The pause made it sound like he'd only just decided on the name. These are some of my friends. Fellow believers, if you will. Your manners leave something to be desired. Ethan's tone was flat, but angry magic peppered the air. McKetrick crossed his arms over his chest. I find that insult rather comical, Mr. Sullivan, coming from an interloper in our city. An interloper? We're humans, you're vampires, but for the result of a genetic mutation, you'd be like us. And that makes you aberrations in our town. 
uninvited guests, guests that need to mind their manners and take their leave. His tone was matter of fact, as if he hadn't just suggested we were genetic aberrations that needed to hightail it out of the city. I beg your pardon, Ethan said, but McKetrick held up a hand. Come now, he said, I know you understand me. You seem to be an intelligent man, as does your colleague here, at least from what we know of her parents. My parents, the Merritts, were New Money Chicago. My father was a real estate investor mentioned in the papers on a daily basis, smart but ruthless. We weren't close, which made me that much less excited to hear I was being judged on the basis of his narcissistic press coverage. Don't let him phase you. Ethan silently said, You know who you are. Your prejudices, he said aloud, are not our problem. We suggest you put down the weapons and continue on your way. Continue on our way? That's truly rich. As if your kind are merely going to continue on your way without bringing the city into an all-out supernatural war? He shook his head. No, thank you, Mr. Sullivan. You and yours need to pack, leave, and be done with it. I'm from Chicago, I said, drawing his attention to me. Born and raised. He lifted a finger. Born and raised human until you switch sides. I almost corrected him. Told him that Ethan had saved me from a killer hired by Selena. Brought me back to life after I'd been attacked. I could also have told him that no matter the challenges I faced as a vampire, Ethan was the reason I still drew breath. But I didn't think McKetrick would be thrilled to learn that I'd nearly been killed by one vampire and changed without consent by another. No response, McKetrick asked. Not surprising, given the havoc your house is already wrecked in Chicago. I'm not sure I'd object either. We did not precipitate the strike on our house, I told him. We were attacked. McKetrick tilted his head at us, a confused smile on his face. But she must recognize that you prompted it. Without you, there would have been no violence. All we want is to go about our business. McKetrick smiled magnanimously. He wasn't an unattractive man, but that smile, so calm and self-assured, was terrifying in its confidence. That fits me fine. Simply take your business elsewhere. As should be clear now, Chicago doesn't want you. Ethan steeled his features. You haven't been elected. You haven't been appointed. You have no right to speak on behalf of the city. A city that had fallen under your spell. A city finally waking up to your deviance. Sometimes, Mr. Sullivan, the world needs a prophet. A man who can look beyond the now, see the future, and understand what's necessary. What do you want? He chuckled. We want our city back, of course. We want the departure of all vampires in Chicago. We don't care where you go. We just don't want you here. I hope that's understood. Fuck you, Ethan said. Fuck you and your prejudice. McKetrick looked disappointed, as if he truly expected Ethan to see the error of his ways. He opened his mouth to retort, but before he could answer, I heard it. Cutting through the night like roaring thunder, the sound of rumbling exhaust. I glanced behind me and saw the headlights, a dozen in all, moving like an arrow toward us. Motorcycles. I began to grin, now knowing whom Ethan had contacted on his cell phone. These weren't just motorcycles. They were shifters. The cavalry had arrived. The troops looked back to their leader, not sure of the next step. They cut through the darkness like sharks on chrome. Twelve giant, gleaming, low-riding bikes, one shifter on each, brawny and leather-clad, ready for battle. And I could attest to the battle part. I'd seen them fight. I knew they were capable, and the tingle that lifted the hair at the back of my neck proved they were well-armed. Correction. Eleven of them were brawny and leather-clad. The twelfth was a petite brunette with a mass of long curly hair, currently pulled back beneath a cardinal's ball cap. Fallon Keen, 
the only sister among six keen brothers named alphabetically from Gabriel down to Adam, who'd been removed from the NAC and sent into the loving arms of a rival pack after he took out their leader. No one had heard from Adam since that exchange had taken place. Given his crime, I assumed that wasn't a good sign. I nodded at Fallon, and when she offered back a quick salute, I decided I could live with her poor choice of baseball allegiances. Gabriel Keene, Pack Apex, rode the bike in front. His sun-kissed brown hair pulled into a queue at the nape of his neck, his amber eyes scanning the scene with what looked like malicious intent. But I knew better. Gabriel eschewed violence unless absolutely necessary. He wasn't afraid of it, but he didn't seek it out. Gabriel revved his bike with a flick of his wrist, and like magic, McKetrick's men stepped back toward their SUVs. Gabe turned his gaze on me. Problems, kitten? I looked over at McKetrick, who was scanning the bikes and their riders with a nervous expression. I guess his anti-vamp bravado didn't extend to shifters. After a moment, he seemed to regain his composure and made eye contact with us again. I look forward to continuing this conversation at a more appropriate time, McKetrick said. We'll be in touch. In the meantime, stay out of trouble. With that, he slipped back into the SUV, and the rest of his troops followed him. I bit back disappointment. I'd almost wish they'd been naive enough to make a move just so I can enjoy watching the Keens pummel them into oblivion. With a roar from custom mufflers, the SUV squealed into action and drove away. Pity it wasn't forever. I checked the license plates, but they were blank. Either they were driving around without registrations, or they'd taken off the plates for their little introductory chat. Gabe glanced at Ethan. Who's G.I. Joe? He said his name was McKetrick. He imagines himself to be an anti-vampire vigilante. He wants all vamps out of the city. Gabe clucked his tongue. He's probably not the only one, he said, glancing at me. Trouble does seem to find you, kitten. As Ethan can verify, I had nothing to do with it. We were driving toward Creeley Creek when we hit the roadblock. They popped out with guns. Gabe rolled his eyes. Only vampires would find that a limitation instead of a challenge. You are immortal, after all. And we prefer to keep it that way, Ethan said. The weapons looked custom. Anti-vamp rounds, Gabriel asked. It wouldn't surprise me. McKetrick seemed like the type. And my sword is at the house, I pointed out to Gabe. You give me thirty-two inches of folded steel and I'll take on anyone you want. He rolled his eyes, then revved his bike and glanced over at Ethan. You're headed to Creeley Creek? We are. Then we're your escorts. Hop in the car and we'll get you there. We owe you one. Gabriel shook his head. Consider it one more notch off the tab I owe merit. He'd mentioned that debt before. I still had no idea what he thought he owed me. But I nodded anyway and jogged back to the Mercedes. I slid inside the car. You said the fairies detested humans. Right now, I feel like detest is hardly a strong enough word. And it looks like we can add one more problem to the punch list. That would appear to be the case, he said, turning on the engine. At least we're still friends with the shifters, I said, as we zoomed through the stop sign ahead of us, the shifters making a shield-like V of bikes around the car and officially enemies with humans again, some of them anyway. As we moved down the street and finally began to gain speed, our escort of shapeshifters beside us, I turned back to the road and sighed. Let the good times roll. Chapter 3. Science Friction Creeley Creek was a prairie-style building, low and horizontal with lots of long windows, overhanging eaves, and bare, honeyed wood. It was bigger than the average prairie-style home, built at the turn of the 20th century by an architect with a renowned ego. When the original owner died, his estate donated the house to the city of Chicago, which deemed it the official residence of the mayor. 
It was to Chicago what Gracie Mansion was to New York City. Currently living there was the politician Chicago had always wanted: handsome, popular, a master orator with friends on both sides of the aisle. Whether or not you liked the slant of his politics, he was very, very good at his job. The gate opened when we arrived. The guard who stood inside the glass box at the edge of the street, waving us onto the grounds. Ethan circled the Mercedes around the drive and pulled into a small parking area beside the house. From a house of vampires to a house of politicians, he muttered as we walked to the front door. Said the most political of vampires, I reminded him, and got a growl in response. But I stood my ground. He was the one who traded a relationship with me for political considerations. I look forward. He said as we walked across the tidy brick driveway, "To your turn at the helm." I assumed he meant the day I'd become a master vampire. It wasn't exactly something I looked forward to, but it would get me out of Cadogan House. You look forward to it because we'd be equally matched politically. I mean, he slid me a dry glance because I'll enjoy watching you squirm under the pressure. Charming, I muttered. A woman in a snug navy blue suit stood in front of the double front doors beneath a low overhanging stone eave. Her hair was pulled into a tight bun, and she wore thick horn-rimmed glasses. There were quite a contrast to the patent platform heels. Was she going for the sexy librarian? Maybe, Mr. Sullivan Merritt. I'm Tabitha Bentley, the mayor's assistant. The mayor is ready to see you. But I understand there are some preliminaries we need to address. She lifted her gaze to the threshold above us. The old wives' tale was that vampires couldn't enter a house if they hadn't been invited in. But like lots of other fang-related myths, this was less about magic and more about rules. Vampires loved rules: what to drink, where to stand, how to address higher-ranking vampires, and so on. We would appreciate the mayor's official invitation into his house," Ethan said, without detailing the reasons for the request. She nodded primly. "I have been authorized to extend an invitation to you and Merritt to Creeley Creek." Ethan smiled politely. "We thank you for your hospitality and accept your invitation." The deal struck. Miss Bentley opened the doors and waited while we walked into the hallway. It wasn't my first time in the mansion. My father, being well moneyed, and Tate, being well connected, were acquaintances, and my father had occasionally dragged me to Creeley Creek for some fundraiser or other. I looked around and concluded it hadn't changed much since the last time I'd visited. The floors were gleaming stone, the walls horizontal planks of dark wood. The house was cool and dark. The hallway illuminated with golden light cast down from wall-mounted sconces. The smell of vanilla cookies permeated the air. That smell of bright lemons and sugar reminded me of Tate. It was the exact same scent I caught the last time I'd seen him. Maybe he had a favorite snack, and the Creeley Creek staff obliged. But the man in the hallway wasn't one I'd expected to see. My father. Dapper in a sharp black suit, walked toward us. He didn't offer a handshake. The arrogance was typical Joshua Merritt. Ethan, Merritt, Joshua. Ethan said with a nod. Meeting with the mayor this evening. I was. My father said. You're both well. Sadly, I was surprised that he cared. We're fine. I told him. What brings you here? Business council issues. My father said he was a member of the Chicago Growth Council, a group geared toward bringing new businesses to the city. I also put in a good word about your house. He added about the strides you've taken with the city's supernatural populations. Your grandfather keeps me apprised. That was very magnanimous of you, Ethan said, his confusion matching my own. My father smiled pleasantly, then glanced from us to Tabitha. I see that you're heading in. Don't let me keep you. Good to see you both. Tabitha stepped in front of us, heels clacking on the floor as she marched deeper into the mansion. Follow me, 
she called back. Ethan and I exchanged a glance. What just happened? I asked. For some unknown reason, your father has suddenly become friendly? There was undoubtedly a business-related reason for that, which I assumed we'd find out soon enough. In the meantime, we did as we were told and followed Tabitha down the hallway. Seth Tate had the look of a playboy who'd never quite reformed. Tousled coal-black hair, blue eyes under long, dark brows. He had a face women swooned over, and as a second-term mayor, the political chops to back up the looks. That explained why he'd been named one of Chicago's most eligible bachelors, and one of the country's sexiest politicians. He met us in his office, a long, low room that was paneled floor to ceiling in wood. A gigantic desk sat at one end of the room in front of a tufted, red leather chair that could have doubled as a throne. Both the desk and the throne stood beneath an ominous five-foot-wide painting. Most of the canvas was dark, but the outlines of a group of suspicious-looking men were visible. They stood around a man positioned near the center of the painting his arms above his head, cowering as they pointed down at him. It looked like they were condemning him for something. It wasn't exactly an inspiring painting. Tate, who stood in the middle of the room, reached out a hand toward Ethan, no hesitation in the movement. Ethan! Mr. Mayor! They shared a manly handshake. How are things at the house? I'd say the mood is anticipatory. With protesters at the gate, one tends to wait for the other shoe to drop. After they'd shared a knowing look, Tate turned to me, a smile blossoming. Merit, he said, voice softer. He took both my hands and leaned toward me, pressing a soft kiss to my cheek, the scent of sugared lemon floating around him. I just met with your father. We saw him on the way out. He released me and smiled but as he looked me over, the smile faded. Are you all right? I must have looked shaken. Being held up at gunpoint will do that to a girl. But before I could speak, Ethan sent me a warning. Don't mention McKetrick, he said, not until we know more about his alliances. There was a protest outside the house, I obediently told Tate. It was unnerving. A lot of prejudice was thrown around. Tate offered an apologetic look. Unfortunately, we can't deny the protesters their permits for First Amendment reasons. But we can always step in if matters escalate. We had things well in hand, I assured him. Gabriel Keene's announcement that shapeshifters exist hasn't done much for your popularity. No, it hasn't, Ethan admitted. But he came to the fight at the house when our backs were against the wall. Going public, getting his side of the story out there, was the best of a bad set of options for protecting his people. I don't necessarily disagree, Tate said. He doesn't make the announcement, and we end up having to arrest every shifter there for assault and disturbing the peace. We couldn't just let them off without some justification. The announcement gave us that reason, helped the public understand why they joined the fight and why we weren't arresting them on sight. I'm sure they appreciate your understanding. Tate offered a sardonic look. I doubt that kind of thing interests them. Shifters don't strike me as the most political types. They aren't, Ethan agreed, but Gabriel is savvy enough to understand when a favor's been done, and when a favor needs to be returned. He wasn't happy about making the announcement, and he has even less interest in his people getting pulled into the public sphere of vampires. He's working on that now, keeping his people out of the public's notice. That's actually the reason I asked you to meet with me, Tate said. I realize it's an unusual request, and I appreciate your coming on such short notice. He sat down in the throne behind his desk, the onlookers in the portrait now pointing down at him. Tate gestured toward two smaller chairs that sat in front of his desk. Please, have a seat. Ethan took a chair. I took point behind him, sentinel at the ready. Mayor Tate's eyes widened at the gesture, but his expression turned back to business fast enough. He flipped open a folder and uncapped an expensive-looking fountain pen. Ethan crossed one leg over the other, the signal he was moving into political chat position. 
What can we do for you? he asked, his voice oh so casual. You said the mood at the house was anticipatory. That's a concern I have about the city more broadly. The attack on Cadogan has reactivated the city's fear of the supernatural. Of the other. We had four days of riots the first time around, Ethan. I'm sure you'll understand the tricky position that puts me in, keeping the citizenry calm while trying to be understanding towards your challenges, including Adam Keene's attack. Of course, Ethan graciously said. But humans are nervous, increasingly so, and that nervousness is leading to an uptick in crime. In the last two weeks, we've seen marked increases in assault, in batteries, in arson, in the use of firearms. I've worked hard to get those numbers down since my first election, and I think the city's better for it. I'd hate to see us slide backward. I think we'd all agree with that, Ethan said aloud. But that was just the precursor to the silent conversation between us as Ethan activated our telepathic link. What's he building toward? Your guess is as good as mine, I answered. Tate frowned and glanced down at the folder on his desk. He scanned whatever information he found there, then lifted a document from it and extended it toward Ethan. Humans, it seems, are not the only increasingly violent folk in our city. Ethan took the document, staring silently down at it until his shoulders tensed into a flat line. Ethan, what is it? I asked. Without bothering to answer, Ethan handed the paper over his shoulder. I took it from him. It looked like part of a police transcript. Question. Tell me what you saw, Mr. Jackson. Answer. There were dozens of them. Vampires, you know. Fangs and the ability to get inside your mind. And they was blood crazy. All of them. Everywhere you looked. Vampire, vampire, vampire. Bam! Vampire! And they were all over us. No escape. Question. Who couldn't escape? Answer. Humans. Not when the vampires wanted you. Not when they wanted to take you down and pull that blood right out of you. All of them were on you, and the music was so loud, and it was pounding like a hammer against your heart. They were crazed with it. Crazy with it. Question. With what? Answer. With the blood. With the lust for it. The hunger. You could see it in their crazy eyes. They were silver, just like the eyes of the devil. You only get one look at those eyes before the devil himself pulls you down into the abyss. Question. And then what happened, Mr. Jackson? Answer. Shaking his head. The hunger. The lust. It got them. Drove them. They killed three girls. Three of them. They drank until there was no life left. The page stopped there, my fingers shaking around the paper. I skipped the chain of command and glanced up at Tate. Where did you get this? Tate met my gaze. Cook County Jail. This was from an interview with a man who'd been arrested for possession of a controlled substance. The detective wasn't sure if he was drunk or disturbed, or if he'd actually seen something that required our attention. Fortunately, she took the transcript to her supervisor, who brought it to my chief of staff. We've yet to find the victims of whom Mr. Jackson spoke. No missing persons match his descriptions. Although we are actively investigating the accusation. Where did this occur? Ethan quietly asked. Tate's gaze dropped down to Ethan and narrowed. He said West Town, and he hasn't been more specific than offering up the neighborhood. Since we haven't identified a crime scene or the victims, it's possible he exaggerated the violence. On the other hand, as you can see from the transcript, he's quite convinced the vampires of our fair city were involved in a bloodlust-driven attack on humans, an attack that left three innocents dead. After a moment of silence, Tate sat back, crossed his hands behind his head, and rocked back in the chair. I'm not thrilled this is going on in my city. I'm not happy about the attack on your house and whatever animosity lies between you and the Pax. And I'm not happy that my citizens are scared enough of vampires that they've lined up outside your home to protest your existence. Tate sat forward again, fury in his expression. But you know what really pisses me off? The fact that you don't look surprised about Mr. Jackson's report.
The fact that I've learned you're well aware of the existence of drinking parties you call raves. My stomach clenched with nerves. Tate was normally poised, politic, careful with words, and invariably optimistic about the city. This voice was the kind you'd expect to hear in a smoky back room or a dark restaurant booth. The kind of tone you'd have heard in Al Capone's Chicago. This was the Seth Tate that destroyed his enemies, and we were now his targets. We've heard rumors, Ethan finally said, a master of understatement. Rumors of blood orgies? Of raves, Ethan admitted. Small gatherings where vampires drink communally from humans. Raves were usually organized by rogue vampires, the ones that weren't tied to a house and tended not to follow traditional house rules. For most houses, those rules meant not snacking on humans, consenting or not. Cadogan allowed drinking, but still required consent. And I didn't know of any house that would condone outright murder. We come close to having raves pop into the public eye a few months ago, but with a little investigation on our part, we'd managed to keep them in the closet. I guess that blissful ignorance was behind us. We've been keeping our ears to the ground, Ethan continued, to identify the organizers of the raves, their methods, the manners in which they attract humans. That was Malik's job, Ethan's second-in-command, the runner-up for the crown. After a blackmailing incident, he'd been put in charge of investigating the raves. And what have you found? Tate asked. Ethan cleared his throat. Ah, the sound of stalling. We're aware of three raves in the last two months, he said. Three raves involving at most half a dozen vampires. These were small, intimate affairs. While bloodletting does occur, we have not heard of the, shall we say, frenetic violence of which Mr. Jackson speaks, nor would we condone such things. There has certainly never been an allegation that any participant was drained, and if we'd heard of it, we'd have contacted the ombudsman or put a stop to it ourselves. The mayor linked his fingers together on the desktop. Ethan, I believe that part and parcel of keeping the city safe is integrating the vampires into the human population. Division will solve nothing. It will only lead to more division. On the other hand, according to Mr. Jackson, Vampires are engaging in violent, large-scale, and hardly consensual acts. This is unacceptable to me, as it is to me and mine, Ethan said. I've heard talk about a recall election, Tate said. I will not go down in flames because of supernatural hysteria. The city does not need a referendum on vampires or shapeshifters. But most important, he continued, gaze burrowing into Ethan. You do not want a bevy of aldermen showing up at your front door, demanding that you close down your house. You do not want the city council legislating you out of existence. I felt a burst of magic from Ethan. His angst and anger were rising, and I was glad Tate was human and couldn't sense the uncomfortable prickle of it. And you do not want me as an enemy, Tate concluded. You do not want me requesting a grand jury to consider the crimes of you and yours. He flipped through the folder on his desk and slid out a single sheet and held it up. You do not want me executing this warrant for your arrest on the basis that you've aided and abetted the murder of humans in this city. Ethan's voice was diamond cold, but the magical tingle was seismic in magnitude. I have done no such thing. Oh? Tate placed the paper on his desk again. I have it on good authority that you changed a human into a vampire without her consent. He lifted his gaze to me, and I felt the blood rush to my cheeks. I also have it on good authority that while you and your vampire council promised to keep Selena de Solonay contained in Europe, she's been in Chicago. Are those actions such a far stretch from murder? Who suggested Selena was in Chicago? Ethan asked. The question was carefully put. We knew full well that Selena, the former head of Navarre House and my would-have-been killer, had been released by the Greenwich Presidium, the organizing body for European and North American vampires. We also knew that once the GP let her go, she'd made her way back to Chicago. But we hadn't thought she was still here. 
The last few months had been too drama-free for that. Or so they seemed. Tate arched his eyebrows. I notice you don't deny it. As for the information, I have my sources. Just as I'm sure you do. Sources or not, I don't take kindly to blackmail. With shocking speed, Tate switched back from Capone to front-page orator, smiling magnanimously at us. Blackmail is such a harsh word, Ethan. And what, precisely, do you want? I want for you, for us, to do the right thing for the city of Chicago. I want for you and yours to have a chance to take control within your own community. Tate linked his hands on the desk and looked us over. I want this problem solved. I want an end to these gatherings, these raves, and a personal guarantee that you have this problem under control. If it's not done, the warrant for your arrest will be executed. I assume we understand each other. There was silence until Ethan finally bit out. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Like a practiced politico, Tate instantly softened his expression. Excellent. If you have anything to report, or if you need access to any of the city's resources, you need only contact me. Of course. With a final nod, Tate turned back to his papers, just as Ethan might have done if I'd been called into his office for a friendly chat. But this time, it was Ethan who'd been called out, and it was Ethan who rose and walked back to the door. I followed, ever the dutiful sentinel. Ethan kept the fear or concern or vitriol or whatever emotion was driving him to himself, even as we reached the Mercedes. And I meant driving literally. He expressed that pent-up frustration with $80,000 of German engineering and a 300-horsepower engine. He managed not to clip the gate as he pulled out of the drive but he treated the stop signs between Creeley Creek and Lakeshore Drive like meek suggestions. Ethan floored the Mercedes, zooming in and around traffic like the silver-eyed devil was on our tail. Problem was, we were the silver-eyed devils. We were both immortal, and Ethan probably had a century of driving experience under his belt, but that didn't make the turns any less harrowing. He raced through a light and on to Lakeshore Drive, turned south and gunned it, and he kept driving until the city skyline glowed behind us. I was almost afraid to ask where he was taking us. Did I really want to know where predatory vampires blew off political steam? But he saved me the trouble when we reached Washington Park. He pulled off Lakeshore Drive, and a few squealing turns later, we were coasting onto Promontory Point, a small peninsula that jutted into the lake. Ethan drove around the tower-topped building and stopped the car in front of the rock ledge that separated grass from lake. Without a word, he climbed out of the car and slammed it shut again. When he hopped the rock ledge that ringed the peninsula and disappeared from sight, I unfastened my seatbelt. It was time to go to work. Chapter 4 The Savage Beast The air was thick and damp, the sharp smell of ozone signaling rain. The lake looked like it was already in the middle of a squall. Whitecaps rolled across the water like jagged teeth, and waves pounded the rocky shoreline. I glanced up at the sky. The anvil-shaped marker of a gigantic thunderstorm was swelling in the southwestern sky, visible each time lightning flashed across it. Without warning, a crack split the air. I jumped and looked back at the building, thinking it had been struck by an early bolt of lightning but the building was quiet and still, and when another crack shattered the silence, I realized the sound had come from a stand of trees on the other side of the building. I walked around to investigate and found Ethan standing at the base of a pine tree like a fighter facing down a forty-foot-tall opponent. His fists were up, his body bladed. Every time, he yelled, every time I manage to bring things under control, we become enmeshed in bullshit again and then he pivoted and thrust out and punched the tree. Crack. The tree wobbled like it had been rammed by a truck, needles whooshing as limbs moved. The smell of pine resin and blood lifted in the breeze, and those weren't the only things in the air. Magic rippled off Ethan's body in waves, leaving its telltale tingle around us. 
And that, I thought, explained why he'd driven here instead of the house. With that much anger banked, there was no way Ethan could have gone home. Catagon's vampires, even those who weren't as sensitive to magic as I was, would have known something was wrong, and that certainly wasn't going to ease the anticipatory mood. It was an obvious downside of being a master vampire, to be all riled up with nowhere to go. Do you have any idea how long, how hard I've worked to make this house successful? And this human, this temporary blip in the chronology of the world, threatens to take it all away. Ethan reared back for a second strike, but he'd already split his knuckles, and the poor tree probably wasn't faring much better. I understood the urge to rail out when you were being held accountable for another's evils, but hurting himself wasn't going to solve the problem. It was time to intervene. I was standing on the lawn between the building and the lake. I figured that was a perfect place to work off a little tension. Why don't you pick on someone your own size? I called out. He looked over, one eyebrow defiantly arched. Don't tempt me, Sentinel. I peeled off my suit jacket and dropped it onto the ground, then put my hands on my hips and, hopefully for the last time tonight, pulled out my vampire bravado. Are you afraid you can't handle me? His expression was priceless, equal parts tempted and irritated, the masculinity warring with the urge to tamp down the challenge to his authority. Watch your mouth. It was a legitimate question, I countered. Ethan was already walking closer, the smell of his blood growing stronger. I won't deny it. My hunger was perked. I'd bitten Ethan twice before, and both times had been memorable. Sensual, in ways I wasn't entirely comfortable admitting. The scent of his blood triggered those memories again. And I knew my own eyes had silvered, even if I wasn't thrilled about being tempted. It was a childish question he growled out, taking another step forward. I disagree. If you want to fight, try a vampire. Your attempts at being clever aren't serving you, Sentinel. He moved within striking range, blood dripping from his right knuckles, which were split nearly to the bone. They'd heal, and quickly, but they must have hurt. And yet, I said, squeezing my own hands into fists, here you are. His eyes flashed silver. Remember your position. Does putting me in my place make you feel better? I am your master. Yes, you are, in Hyde Park and in Creeley Creek, and wherever else vampires are gathered. You're my master. But out here, it's just you and me and the chip tape put on your shoulder. You can't go back to the house like this. You're pouring magic, and that's going to worry everyone even more than they already are. There was a tick above his eyebrow, but Ethan held his tongue. Out here, I quietly said, it's just you and me. And don't say I didn't warn you. With no more warning, he offered up his favorite move, a roundhouse kick that he swiveled toward my head. But I dropped my arm and shoulder and blocked it. That move thwarted, Ethan bounced back into position. Don't get cocky, Sentinel. You've only taken me down once. I tried a roundhouse of my own, but he dodged it, ducking and spinning around the kick, before popping up again. Maybe so, I said. But how many novitiates have beaten you before? He scowled and offered a jab combination that I easily rebuffed. For all the vampiric power we could put behind our shots, this wasn't a real battle. This was play fighting, the release of tension. Never fear, he said. You may have gotten me down but I've been above you before, and I'm sure I'll manage it again. He was being arrogant, letting the gentle, insistent veneer he'd been wearing lately slip. But I'd managed to transmute his anger into romantic steam, which softened his punches. I swatted away a half-hearted jab. Don't get your hopes up. I'm not that kind of hungry. My hopes, as you call them, are perpetually up when you're in the vicinity. Then I'll try to stay farther away, I sweetly responded. That won't exactly be conducive to your standing sentinel. Neither will your being arrested, I said, bringing him back to the point. Ethan ran his hands through his blonde locks, then linked his fingers together atop his head. 
I'm doing everything I can to keep the city together, and it's only getting harder. And now within a few hours, we see the ugly side of freedom of speech. We learn Chicago has a militia, and we discover Tate's out for blood. My blood. My heart clenched in sympathy, but I resisted the urge to reach out to him. We were colleagues, I reminded myself. Nothing more. I know it's frustrating, I said, and I know Tate was out of line with the warrant. But what can we do but try to solve the problem? Frowning, Ethan turned back to the lake, then walked toward it. The edge of the peninsula was terraced into stone rings that formed giant steps into the water. He shed his suit jacket, placing it gingerly on the stone ledge before sitting down beside it. Was it wrong that I was a wee bit disappointed he didn't just shed the shirt altogether? When I joined him, he picked up a pebble and pitched it. Even with the chomp, it flew like a bullet across the water. This doesn't sound like a rave, I said. What Mr. Jackson described, I mean, at least not like how you've described them before. This didn't sound like it was about seduction or glamour. This isn't some underground hobby. As I waited for him to answer, I pushed the bangs from my face. The wind was picking up. Ethan wound up and threw another pebble, the rock zinging as it skipped ahead. Continue, he said, and I incrementally relaxed. We were back to politics and strategy. That was a good sign. I've experienced first hunger, and first hunger part do. There was a sensual component to both, sure. But at the base they were about blood, the thirst. Not about conquering humans or killing them. We are vampires, he dryly pointed out. Yes, because we drink blood, not because we're psychopaths. I'm not saying there aren't psychopathic vampires, or vampires who wouldn't kill for blood if they were starving for it. But it doesn't sound like that's what's happened here. It sounds like violence, pure and simple. Ethan was quiet for a moment. The hunger for blood is antithetical to violence. If anything, it's about seduction, about drawing the human closer. That is the quintessential purpose of vampire glamour. Glamour was old-school vampire mojo, the ability of vampires to entrance others either by manipulating their targets or by adjusting their own appearances to make themselves more attractive to their victims. I couldn't glamour worth a damn, but I seem to have some immunity toward it. This is the second time raves have gotten us into trouble, I pointed out. We've avoided them until now. And now it's time we shut them down. But we can't go in assuming this is some run-of-the-mill party that got out of hand. This just sounds... different. And if you want a silver lining, at least Tate's giving you a chance to resolve the problem. Giving me a chance? That's putting it mildly. He's doing precisely what Nick Breckenridge attempted to do, blackmailing us into taking action. Or he's giving us an opportunity we didn't have before. How do you figure that? He's forcing our hands, I said, which means that instead of tiptoeing around the GP and worrying what this house or that might think of us, we're forced to get out there and do something about it. We get to spend some of that political capital you're always harping about. Ethan arched an eyebrow imperiously. Talking about. Talking about in well-reasoned and measured tones. This time he rolled his eyes. Look, I continued. The last time we worked on the raves, you made me focus on the media risk. Tonight we've proven that worrying someone might find out about the problem doesn't actually solve the problem. We need to get in front of the issue. We need to close them down. You want to tell vampires they can no longer engage in human blood orgies? Well, I wasn't going to use those words exactly, and I did plan to take my sword. He smiled a little. You are quite a thing to behold when you've got steel in your hands. Yes, I agreed. I touched a hand to my stomach. And now that we're looking on the bright side, let's find some grub. I am starving. Are you ever not starving? Har, har, I nudged his arm. Come on, let's get an Italian beef. He glanced over at me. I assume that has some meaning important within Chicago culinary circles. I just stood there, both saddened that he hadn't experienced the joy of a good Italian beef sandwich 
and irritated that he'd lived in Chicago for so long and had so completely sequestered himself from the stuff that made it Chicago. As important as Red Hots and Deep Dish. Let's go, Liege. It's your turn to get schooled. He growled, but relented. We drove to University Village, parked along the street, and took our places in line with the third shifters on lunch breaks and the UIC students needing late-night snacks. Eventually, we placed our orders and moved to a counter, where I taught Ethan to stand the way God intended Chicagoans to stand. Feet apart, elbows on the table, sandwiches in hand. Ethan hadn't spoken since his own eight-inch Italian beef sandwich had been delivered, still dripping from its dip in gravy. When his first bite left a trail of juice on the floor in front of his feet, and not on his expensive Italian shoes, he smiled grandly at me. Well done, Sentinel. I nodded through my bite of bread, beef, and peppers, happy that Ethan was in a better mood. Say what you might about my obsession with all things meat and carbohydrate, but never underestimate the ability of a stack of thin-sliced beef on a bun to make a man happy, vampire or human. And speaking of happiness, I wondered what else Ethan had been missing out on. Have you ever been to a Cubs game? Ethan dabbed his mouth with a paper napkin, and I got a glimpse of his knuckles, already healed from the blows. No, I have not. As you know, I'm not much of a baseball fan. He wasn't much of a fan, but he'd still track down a signed Cubs baseball to replace the one I'd lost. That was the kind of move that threw me off balance, but I managed to keep things lighthearted. Just stake me now, I said. Seriously, you've been in Chicago how long and you've never been to Wrigley? That's a shame. You need to get out there. I mean, for a night game, obviously. Obviously. A couple of large men with mustaches and bears t-shirts moved toward the high bar where we stood, sandwiches in hand. They took a spot beside Ethan, spread their feet, unwrapped their own Italian beefs, and dug in. It wasn't until bite number two that they glanced over and noticed two vampires were standing beside them. The one closest to Ethan ran a napkin across his dripping mustache, his gaze shifting from me to Ethan. You two look familiar. I know you. Since my photo had been smeared across the front page of the paper a couple of months ago, and Ethan had made the local news more than once since the attack on Cadogan, we probably did look familiar. I'm a vampire from Cadogan House, Ethan said. Our area of the restaurant, not full, but still dotted with late-night munchers, went silent. This time the man looked suspiciously at the sandwich. You like that? It's great, Ethan said, then gestured toward me. This is Merritt. She's from Chicago. She decided I had to try one. The man and his companion leaned forward to look at me. That's so. It is. He was quiet for a moment. You had deep dish yet, or red hot? My heart warmed. We might have been vampires, but at least these guys recognized that we were first and foremost Chicagoans. We knew Wrigley Field and Navy Pier, daily, and rush hour traffic. Soldier Field in December and Oak Street Beach in July. We knew freak snowstorms and freakier heat waves. But most of all, we knew food, taquerias, red hots, deep dish, great beer. We baked it, fried it, sautéed it, and grilled it. And in our quest to enjoy the sunshine and warmth while we could, we shared that food together. Both, I said. I got him pizza from Saul's. The man's bushy eyebrows popped up. You know about Saul's? I smiled slyly. Cream cheese and double bacon. Ooh, the man said, grinning ear to ear. He dropped his napkin and threw his hands into the air. Cream cheese and double bacon. Our fanged friend here knows about Saul's best. He raised his giant paper cup of soda in a toast. To you, my friend, good eats and what not. And to you, Ethan said, raising his sandwich and taking a bite. Hot beef in the name of peace. I liked it. I'm surprised you told them we were vampires, I told Ethan on the way back to the car. 
that you admitted it. I mean, given what we saw earlier tonight. Sometimes the only way to counter prejudice is to remind them how similar we are, to challenge their perceptions of what it means to be vampire or human. Besides, he wouldn't have asked who we were if he hadn't at least suspected, and lying probably would have irritated him further. Quite possibly. He smiled magnanimously. Besides, you clearly wooed them with your cream cheese and double bacon talk. Who wouldn't be wooed by cream cheese and double bacon talk? I mean, other than vegetarians, I guess. But as we have thoroughly established, vegetarianism is not my gig. Ethan opened my car door. No, Sentinel, it is not. I'd climbed inside, and he did the same, but he didn't start the car right away. Problems? I asked. He frowned. I'm not sure I'm ready to return to the house. Not that I'd prefer to be at Creeley Creek, of course. But until I go back to Hyde Park, the drama hasn't quite solidified. He glanced at me. Does that make sense? Only a 400-year-old master vampire would wonder if a grad student could understand procrastination. Of course it does. Procrastination is a very human emotion. I'm not sure humans have a monopoly on procrastination. And more important, I'm not sure this counts as procrastination. He turned back again and started the ignition. Unlike what you're doing. What I'm doing. He smiled just a little, a tease of a smile. Procrastinating, he said, avoiding the inevitability of you and me. How long does inevitability take when you're immortal? He grinned and pulled the Mercedes away from the curb. I suppose we'll find out. One summer night in Chicago. Three sets of battle lines drawn. The protesters were still outside when we returned, their apparent hatred of us undiminished. On the other hand, their energy did seem to be a little diminished. This time, they were sitting on the narrow strip of grass between the sidewalk and street. Some sat in pop-up camping chairs, others sat on blankets and pairs, one's head on the other's shoulder, given the late hour. Late-night prejudice was apparently exhausting. Malik met us at the door, folder in hand. Ethan had given him a heads-up call in the car on the way back to the house. Malik was tall, with cocoa skin, pale green eyes, and closely cropped hair. He had the regal bearing of a prince in training, shoulders back, jaw set, eyes scanning and alert, as if waiting for marauders to scale the castle walls. Militia men and arrest warrants, Malik said. I'm not sure it's advisable for you two to leave the house together anymore. Ethan made a snort of agreement. At this point, I tend to agree with you. Tate indicated the supposed incident was violent. Exceptionally so. According to the first-hand account, Ethan said. Once we were in Ethan's office and he closed the door behind us, he got to the heart of it. The story is, the vamps lost control and killed three humans. But Mr. Jackson's description rang more of uncontrolled bloodlust than of a typical rave. Mr. Jackson, Malik asked. Ethan headed for his desk. Our eyewitness potentially under the influence, but sober enough that Tate was apparently convinced. And by convinced, I mean he's threatening my arrest if we don't fix the problem, whatever it is. Malik, eyes wide, looked between the two of us. He's serious, then. Ethan nodded. He's had the warrant drawn, and that makes this problem our current focus. Tate said the incident occurred in West Town. Look through your rave intel again. Any connections to that neighborhood? Any talk about violence? Anything that would suggest the scale the witness talked about? That assignment given, Ethan looked at me. When the sun sets, talk to your grandfather. Ask him to track down what they can about the Jackson incident, the vampires involved, houses, whatever, and any new information they've gotten about the raves. This may not actually be one, but at the moment it's the best lead we've got. And one way or the other, he added, looking between us. Let's close these things down, shall we? Liege, I agreed with a nod. i definitely visit my grandfather, but my circle of friends had grown a little wider over the last few months. I'd recently been asked to join the Red Guard, 
a kind of vampire watchdog group that kept an eye on Master Vamps and the GP. I'd declined the invitation, but I'd made use of the resource, calling on the RG for backup during the attack on the house. This might be the time to make that call again. And this McKetrick fellow? Malik asked. He'll wait, Ethan said, determination in his eyes. He'll wait until hell freezes over, because we're not leaving Chicago. I'd visit my grandfather when the sun set, but first, I had a couple more hours of darkness and many more hours of daylight to get through. All the bedrooms in the house, which accommodated about ninety of Katagun's three hundred odd vampires, looked like small dorm rooms, a bed, a bureau, a nightstand, small closet, small bathroom. They weren't exactly fancy, but they gave us a respite from the vampire drama. Given the messes we tended to get into, drama-free was definitely a good thing. My second-floor room, just like the rest of the house, still smelled like construction, new paint, varnish, drywall, plastic. It smelled good somehow, like a new beginning, a fresh start. The storm broke overhead just as I shut my door, rain beginning to pelt the shuttered window in my room. I peeled off my suit and towed off Mary Jane heels, then headed to my small bathroom where I scrubbed my face. The makeup washed off easily. The memories, on the other hand, weren't going anywhere. Those were the tough things to ignore. The sounds, the expressions, the sensation of Ethan and his body. I tried to lock the memories away, to keep my mind clear of them in order to get my work done, but they were still there. They stung a little less now, but you couldn't unring the bell. For better or worse, I'd probably always have those memories with me. When I dressed again in a tank top and shorts, I glanced back at the clock. I had two hours to kill until dawn, which meant I had an hour to kill until my weekly date with my other favorite blonde vampire. My first task, taking care of basic vampiric necessities. I walked down the hallway to the second-floor kitchen, smiling at a couple of vaguely familiar-looking vampires as I passed them. Each of the houses above ground floors had a kitchen, a very handy thing, since vampiric emergencies didn't respect cafeteria hours. I opened the fridge and plucked out two drink boxes of Type A blood, prepared by the lamely named Blood For You, our delivery service, then headed back to my room. Most vamps were fortunate enough to retain a pretty good hold on their bloodlust, me included. But just because I wasn't ripping at the seams of the boxes didn't mean I didn't need the blood. Most of the time, bloodlust in vamps was kind of like thirst in humans. If you waited to drink until you were truly thirsty, it was probably already too late. While waiting for Her Highness's arrival, I poked a straw into one of the drink boxes and poured through the stack of books that was beginning to crawl its way up my bedroom wall. It was my TBR, my to-be-read stack. The usual subjects were there. Chicklet, action, a Pulitzer Prize winner, a romance novel about a pirate and a damsel in a low-cut blouse. What? Even a vampire enjoys a little bodice ripping now and again. Even though I'd spent the final hours of more than a few evenings in my vampire dorm room, my TBR stack hadn't gotten any shorter. With each book I finished, I found a replacement in the house's library. And I'd occasionally wake at dusk to find a pile of books outside my door, presumably left by the house librarian, another novitiate vampire. His selections were usually related to politics. Stories about the ancient conflicts between vampires and shapeshifters. Biographies of the 100 most vampire-friendly politicians in Western history. Timelines of vampiric events in history. Unfortunately, no matter how serious the topic, the names were usually just silly. Get to the point. Vampire contributions in Western architecture. Fangs and balances. Vampire Politicians in History To Drink or Not to Drink, A Vampire Dialectic Blood Sausage, Blood Stew, Blood Orange Food for All Seasons And the awfully named Plasmatless, 
which contained maps of important vampire locales. Maybe the managing editor of the Vampire Press was the same guy who wrote the chapter titles for The Canon of the North American Houses, My Vampire Guidebook. Both were equally punny, and just as ridiculous. The names aside, let's be honest, with Ethan running around the house, there were definitely advantages to reading in my room. Was it master avoidance? Absolutely. But when faced with the temptation of something you couldn't have, why not find something more productive to do? Put another way, why order dessert if you couldn't take a bite? So there I was, in a tank and boxers, cross-legged on my bed with to drink or not to drink in hand, the rain pummeling the roof above me. I sighed, leaned back against the pillows, and sank into the words, hoping that I might find something moderately edutaining or infotaining. Whatever. An hour later, Lindsay knocked, and I dog-eared the book. A bad habit, I know but I never had a bookmark handy. The book had actually been informative, discussing the earliest recorded instances of a condition the author called hemoanhedonia, the inability to take pleasure from drinking blood. Vamps with the condition tended to demonize those who drank. Add that to the fact that being a practicing vampire was dangerous in its own right. Humans didn't usually take kindly to being treated like sippy cups and vampires began drinking together privately, away from the criticism. Abracadabra, raves are born. With that historical nugget in mind, I put the book on the nightstand and opened the door. Lindsay, fellow guard and my best friend in the house, assuming Ethan didn't count, and I don't think he did, stood in the hallway with a blonde ponytail, killer figure, and silly smile on her face. She wore jeans and a black T-shirt with Cadogan printed in white block letters across the front. Her feet were bare, her toenails painted gleaming gold. Hi, Blondie. Merit? I like those duds. She cast an appraising glance at my Illinois is for lovers tank top and shamrock patterned cub shorts. Off-duty Cadogan Sentinel at your service. Come on in. She hit the bed. I shut the door behind her. One of our earliest dates as new friends had been a night in her room with pizza and reality television. It wasn't exactly cerebral, but it gave us a chance to be silly for a while, to be concerned with which celebutante was dating which rock star or who was winning this week's crazy challenge, instead of worrying about which groups of people were trying to kill us. The latter was exhausting after a while. I flipped on my tiny television, my sentinel stipend at work, and changed the channel to tonight's reality opera, which involved male contestants solving puzzles so they could escape from an island of ex-girlfriends. It was high-quality stuff. Classy stuff. I joined Linz on the bed and pulled a pillow behind my head. How was the meeting with Tate? she asked. Drama, drama, drama. Luke will fill you in. Suffice it to say, Ethan could be in Cook County lockup next week. Sullivan may have a heart of coal, but I bet he looks really good in orange. And stripes. Rawr, she said, curling her fingers like a cat. Lindsay was even less convinced that Ethan had a legitimate post-breakup change of heart. But that didn't make him any less pretty. I'm sure he'll appreciate your compliments when he's climbing into that jumpsuit, I said. Although Luke might get jealous. As a guard, Luke was Lindsay's boss. He was tall and tousle-haired. His dark blonde locks sun-streaked from years, I imagined, as a boots-wearing cowboy on some high plains ranch where cattle and horses outnumbered humans and vampires. Luke kept the boots after becoming a vampire and he developed a monumental crush on Lindsay. Long story short, nothing had come of it until the attack on the house. Then they started spending more time together. I didn't think it was uber serious. More like a movie night here, a snack at sunset there. But it did seem like he'd finally managed to push through the emotional barrier she directed to keep him at a distance. I completely approved of that development. 
Luke had pined pretty hard. It was about time he tasted victory. Luke can take care of himself, Lindsay said, her voice dry. He'd enjoy it more if you were doing the caring. Lindsay held up a hand. Enough boy talk. If you keep harping about Luke, I'm going to hit you with a Sullivan 1-2 combination, in which case I'll be quizzing you about his hot bod and emotional iciness for the rest of the evening. Spoil sport, I pouted, but let it go. I knew she wasn't completely convinced about Luke, even if she was spending more time with him. And I didn't want to push her too far too fast. And to be fair, just because I thought they'd be good together didn't mean she was obligated to date him. It was her life, and I could respect that. So I let it go and settled into a comfy position beside her, and then let my mind drift on the waves of pre-recorded trashy television. As relaxation went, it didn't exactly rank up there with a hot rock massage and mud bath, but a vampire took what a vampire could get. Chapter 5 Down by the River When I woke again, I dressed in my personal uniform, jeans and a tank top over high-heeled boots, my catagon medal, my sword, and my beeper, and headed out. I stopped at the house gate, intending to get a sense of the gauntlet I'd have to walk to to get to my car. One of the two fairies at the gate guessed my name. They are quiet tonight, he said. Ethan planned ahead. I glanced over at him. He planned ahead? The fairy pointed down the street. I peeked outside the gate, smiling when I realized Ethan's strategy. A food truck hawking Italian beefs was parked at the corner. A dozen protesters standing beside it, sandwiches in hand, their signs propped against the side of the truck. Ethan must have made a phone call. Hot beef in the name of peace, I murmured, then hustled across the street to my ride, a boxy orange Volvo. The car was old and had seen better days, but it got me where I needed to go. Tonight, I needed to go south. You'd think a name as fancy as Ombudsman, which really meant liaison, would have gotten my grandfather a nice office in some fancy city building in the loop. But Chuck Merritt, cop-turned-supernatural administrator, was a man of the people, supernatural or otherwise. So instead of a swank office with a river view, he had a squat brick building on the south side in a neighborhood where the lawns were surrounded by chain-link fences. Normally, the street was quiet, but tonight, cars spilled across the office's yard and down the street a couple of blocks. I'd seen my grandfather surrounded by cars before, at his house in the midst of a water-nymph catfight. Those vehicles had been roadsters with recognizable vanity plates. These were beat-up, hard-driven vehicles with rusty bumpers and paint splatter. I parked and made my way across the yard. The door was unlocked unusual for the office. And music, Johnny Cash's rumbling voice, echoed throughout. The building's decor was all 1970s, but the problems were modern and paranormally driven. So, I assumed, were the boxy men and women who mingled in the hallways, plastic cups of orange drink in hand. They turned and stared at me as I wove through them, their smallish eyes watching as I walked down the hallway. Their features were similar, like they might have been cousins related by common grandparents. All had slightly porcine faces, upturned noses, and apple cheeks. On my way back to the office, Catcher shared with Jeff Christopher, an adorable shifter with mad tech skills and a former crush on me. I passed a large table of fruit, spears of pineapple and red-orange papaya in a watermelon bowl, blood-orange slices dotted with pomegranate seeds, and a pineapple shell full of blueberries and grapes. Snacks for the office guests, I assumed. Merit! Jeff's head popped out from a doorway, and he beckoned me inside. I squeezed through a few more men and women and into the office. Catcher was nowhere in sight. We saw you on the security monitor, Jeff said, moving to the chair behind his bank of computer monitors. His brown hair was getting longer and nearly reached his shoulders now. It was straight and parted down the middle, and currently tucked behind his ears. Jeff had paired a button-up shirt, as he always did, with khakis, his shirt sleeves rolled up to his elbows, 
presumably to give him room to maneuver over his monstrous keyboard. Jeff was tall and lanky, but what he lacked in mass, he more than made up for in fighting skills. He was a shifter and a force to be reckoned with. Thanks for finding me, I told him. What's going on out there? Open house for river trolls. Of course it was. I thought the water nymphs controlled the river. They do. They draw the lines, the trolls enforce them. And the fruit? Jeff smiled. Good catch. River trolls are vegetarians. Fruitarians, really. Offer up fruit and you can lure them out from beneath the bridges. And they prefer not to leave the bridges. I glanced back. Catcher stood in the doorway, played a fruit in hand, and just as Mallory had said, rectangular frames perched on his nose. They were an interesting contrast with the shaved head and pale green eyes, but they totally worked. He'd gone from buff martial arts expert to ripped smart boy. The Sentinel definitely approved. I also approved of his typically snarky T-shirt. Today's read, I got out of bed for this. Mr. Bell, I said, offering a small salute to my former katana trainer. I like the glasses. I appreciate your approval. He moved to his desk and began stabbing the fruit with a toothpick. So, Catcher was a sorcerer, and Jeff was a shifter. Vampires were also represented, at least partly, because Chicago's masters were pretty tight-lipped about house goings-on. My grandfather had a secret vampire employee who offered up information. A vampire, I suspected, largely without evidence, was Malik. Do they live under the bridges? I wondered aloud, returning to the trolls. Rain or shine, summer or winter, Catcher said. And why the open house? Is that just maintaining good supernatural relations? Now that things are escalating, Catcher said, frowning as he used the toothpick to push out the seeds from a chunk of watermelon. We're working through the phone book. Every population gets a visit, an evening with the ombudsman. Things are definitely changing. Jeff agreed. Things are getting louder. We all looked back as a broad-shouldered river troll with short, ginger hair looked into the office. His wide-set eyes blinked curiously at us. He didn't have much neck to speak of, so his entire torso swiveled as he looked us over. A light breeze of magic stirred the air. Hey, George, Catcher said. George nodded and offered a small wave. It's getting louder, the voices, the talk. The winds are changing. There's anger in the air, I think. He paused. We don't like it. He shifted his gaze to me, a question in his eyes. Was I part of the problem, making the city louder, adding to the anger? This is Merritt, Catcher quietly explained. Chuck's granddaughter. Awareness blossomed in George's expression. Chuck is a friend to us. He is quieter than the rest. I wasn't entirely sure what George meant by quiet. I had the sense it meant more to him than simply the absence of sound. But it was clear that he'd meant it as a compliment. Thank you, I said, with as much sincerity as I could push into those two words. George watched me for a moment, thinking, evaluating maybe, before he finally nodded. The act seemed to carry more significance than just an acceptance of my thanks, like I'd been approved by him. I nodded back, my act just as significant. We were two paranormal creatures, members of different tribes, but nevertheless linked together by the city's drama and an ombudsman trying diligently to stem the tide. Accepting each other. The connection made, George disappeared again. Soft-spoken, I commented when he was gone. They are, Jeff said. The RTs keep to themselves, especially when the nymphs request it. And even then, they appear, they work the task, and then they head back beneath the bridges again. What kind of things do they do? Jeff shrugged. Generally, they do the heavy lifting. Playing muscle for a nymph along her chunk of the river if there's a boundary dispute. Maybe enforcing the peace. Maybe helping clean up that chunk of the river if the waters are moving too quickly. Apparently done with his explanation, Jeff stretched out to straighten a silver picture frame now on one corner of his desk. 
I'd previously seen the many-tentacled plush doll that sat atop one of his monitors, but the frame was new. I walked over and peeked around his desk to get a glimpse of the picture. It was a shot of him and Fallon Keen. They'd apparently hit it off when the Keen family, and representatives of the rest of the packs, had come to Chicago to decide whether to stay in their respective cities or head off to their ancestral home in Aurora, Alaska. The packs had voted to stay, and the Keene family hadn't yet returned to their HQ in Memphis. That respite must have given Jeff and Fallon time to get to know each other. In the picture, Jeff and Fallon stood beside each other in front of a flat brick wall, their fingers intertwined, gazing at each other, and in their eyes, something weighty and important. Love already? You look very happy, I told Jeff. Crimson rose on his cheeks. Catcher's giving me crap about moving too fast, he said, keeping his gaze on the monitors in front of him. But he's one to talk. He is already living with my former roommate, I agreed. Still in the room, Catcher said, and speaking of things in the room, what brings you by? Just the usual door darkening crap. First item on the agenda, some kind of G.I. Joe wannabe organization led by a man named McKetrick. They set up a roadblock not far from the house. They had full military gear, combat boots, black clothes, black SUVs without license plates. No black helicopters? Jeff asked. I know, right? McKetrick has styled himself as some kind of human savior from the vampire invasion. He thinks fangs make us a genetic mistake. A mistake he's going to remedy? Catcher asked. I nodded. Precisely. He said his goal is getting vamps out of Chicago, and, I assume, filling that vacuum with his sparkling personality. We'll do some digging, find out what we can. Catcher tilted his head curiously. How did you get out of the roadblock? Ethan called our favorite pack members. Keen brought the family and then some. Nice, Jeff said. Um, was Fallon there? She was, but in a cardinal's cap. Can't you do something about that? He shrugged sheepishly. I know how to pick my battles, so no. Oh, and did you hear? Tanya had the baby, a nine-pound boy, Connor Devereaux Keen. I smiled back at him. Tanya was Gabriel's wife. She'd been quite pregnant the last time I'd seen her, and they'd already decided on Connor as a name. Nine pounds? That's a big boy. Jeff smiled knowingly. That's what she said. Catcher cleared his throat. What's the second thing? Raves. They both looked up at me. What about them? Catcher asked. That was actually my first question. At best, we have raves popping into the public eye, for real this time. And worst? Catcher asked. We have something with the markings of a rave, but that actually involves psycho vamps committing atrocities against multiple humans. Three supposed deaths so far, but there's no physical evidence. There was silence in the office. You serious? Catcher asked, voice grave. Aspen serious. I gave them the details on Mr. Jackson and his experience, on the mayor's investigation, and on our visit to his home. It worried me that they didn't already have these details. My grandfather, after all, was the city's supernatural ombudsman. He should have been the first person Tate called. Is it because of me? I asked. Is Tate keeping information from him because I'm his granddaughter? Because I'm in Cadogan? Catcher pushed away his plate of fruit, propped his elbows on the table, and rubbed his temples. I don't know, and I really don't like that idea. But I do know Chuck won't be pleased at the possibility that we're a figurehead group. An office Tate keeps open to make Supps think he gives a shit. While he's keeping important information from us, Jeff finished. On the other hand, Catcher thoughtfully said, it wouldn't be our job to investigate. That's the role of the CPD detectives. But he'd normally give us a heads up so we could make contact with the houses or the rogues. He shook his head. We always thought Tate was a little cagey. I guess this proves you have to keep one ear to the ground, even when you're supposedly in the loop. And speaking of keeping an ear to the ground, what's the word on raves? 
Anything new in the ether? He frowned. I assume you've talked to Malik or Ethan and know about the three we've tracked. I've heard, I growled out. With a nod, Catcher rose and went to a whiteboard newly installed on one end of the office, uncapped a green marker and began writing. Accompanied by the squeak of the pen, he started by drawing what looked like an angled, limp fish. What's that? Chicago, he said without turning around. Seriously? That's how you represent the city you work for? As a fish? It really does look like a fish, Jeff said excitedly. Oh, maybe it's an Asian carp. Are you making a metaphor about raves and invasive species? Clever, I said with a smile for Jeff. He leaned back in his chair, smiling proudly. That's what the ladies say. I rolled my eyes and turned back to Catcher, who was glaring at both of us above his Buddy Holly glasses. I had to bite my lip to keep from laughing aloud. As I was saying, he continued, before placing stars on the map in different locations, we know about three new raves in the last two months. Intel from the secret vampire? I wondered aloud. Two of them, Catcher admitted, the third from Malik. All were second or third-hand reports. Okay, so that pretty much blew my Malik is the secret source theory. There's also the rave we visited along the lakeshore, Catcher added, placing another star on the board. We didn't find out about that one until after the rave was over and the vamps had closed up shop. As a result, we only walked away with a guess about the number of attendees and a clue as to who'd also investigated the Red Guard, and a shifter we later learned had been our blackmailer. There are also the raves we knew about before we visited that rave, and the one Tate identified. It was in West Town. Catcher nodded, grabbed a blue marker, and filled in those stars. I squinted at Catcher's drawing, but still couldn't make heads or tails of it, except that it still looked like a fish. Could you at least show us where Navy Pier is? I asked him. I have no idea what I'm looking at. Catcher grumbled, but obliged, and drew a tiny rectangle poking out from one side of the fish. Jeff chuckled. Is that Navy Pier, or is Chicago just happy to see me? I laughed so hard I snorted a little, at least until Catcher pounded a fist on top of the closest table. Hey, I objected, pointing at him. My master might be in Cook County lockup by the end of the week and that won't exactly be good for me. Sarcasm is my way of relieving stress, as you know, since you've seen me and Mallory at it. Ironically, saying the jail bit aloud again made my stomach crumple with nerves. The catcher's expression softened. He glanced back at the board, a smile at one corner of his mouth. I guess it does look kind of ridiculous. And since you've acknowledged that, you may continue, I magnanimously offered. So the raves, he said without delay, are sprinkled across the city. No apparent pattern, no apparent locus of activity. That's telling in itself, I said, sitting up. That says there's no rave headquarters, not where the parties are held anyway, and that the vamps are smart enough to move the party around. So no humans or masters, if these are housed vamps, get suspicious, Jeff added. Exactly, Catcher said. What about the size? I asked. The scale. Mr. Jackson was convinced there were dozens of vamps there, and that the entire thing was American psycho-violent. Just like the site we visited, our current intel says raves were a handful of vamps and a few humans. Small, intimate. Focused on the act of giving and accepting blood. To continue the movie analogy, this isn't Fight Club. More like love at first bite, Jeff said. Catcher rolled his eyes again. So this new incident we're talking about is something unprecedented in terms of size and violence, without matching missing persons reports and no actual evidence of a crime. He shrugged. That suggests Mr. Jackson wasn't entirely honest. Problem is, we haven't talked to any vampires who were actually there. That would be the real coup, getting someone in from the beginning. On the ground floor figuring out who's there, how the information is being passed, who's participating, and whether they're participating willingly. 
Can you pull in data from the CPD? I asked. See what their files have to say? Done and done, Jeff said, sitting forward and beginning to tap on his keyboard. Might have to dig a little to find it. Their IT architecture is for shit, but I'll let you know. Of course, just because the ombuds office didn't have information didn't mean there wasn't information to be had. It was probably time to tap my next source. Thanks, I told both of them. Can you give me a call if you hear anything else? Of course. I assume Sullivan's going to send you out on some sort of crazy psycho vampire hunting field trip. The forecast is strong. Call me if you need backup, Catcher said. Of course, I agreed, but I actually had an idea about that as well. After all, Jonah had been offered up as a partner. And if you do go, Catcher added, look for identifying information. Listen for any word about how they're contacting vamps or identifying humans. Will do. You want me to find Chuck before you leave? Jeff asked. I waved him off. No worries. He's busy. Let him handle his open house. I'm pretty sure I can manage a job and family, both, said a gravelly voice at the door. I glanced back and smiled as my grandfather walked into the office. He was dressed up tonight having traded in the long-sleeved plaid shirt for a corduroy blazer. But he'd stuck with the khaki pants and thick-soled grandpa shoes. He walked over to where I sat at the edge of the desk and planted a kiss on my forehead. I was my favorite vampire. I put an arm around his waist and gave him a half-hug. Are there any others in the running? Now that you mention it, no. They tend to be rather high-maintenance. Amen. Catcher and Jeff simultaneously said. I gave them a snarky look. What brings you to our neck of the woods? I was filling in Catcher and Jeff about our latest drama. Long story short, Black Ops and Raves 2.0. He grimaced. That wouldn't thrill me even if I weren't your grandfather. Nope, I agreed. I hate to be the bearer of bad news myself, he said but your father tells me you haven't spoken in a few weeks. I didn't care for my father, but I cared even less for the fact that he'd put my grandfather in the middle of our feud. Actually, I saw him leaving the mayor's home last night. We had a very pleasant exchange, I assured my grandfather. Good girl, he said with a smile. I hopped off the desk. It was time to get the rest of the investigative show on the road. I need to run, and you need to get back to your party, so I'll let them fill you in on the details. As if there's a chance I could avoid it, my grandfather said. He hugged me one more time, then let me go. I said my goodbyes and walked back to the front door, the river trolls nodding at me when I passed as if I'd been vetted. Not as a vampire, maybe, but at least as the granddaughter of a man they trusted. Friends in high places definitely helped especially if you had enemies in even higher spots. My phone rang just as I was getting back into my car. I pulled the door shut and flipped it open. It was Mallory. Hey, blue hair, what's up? She didn't speak, but she immediately began sobbing. Mal, what's wrong? Are you okay? Catharsis, she said. It's one of those catharsis cries. I blew out a breath. I'd been prepared to squeal tires in the rush to get to her if she'd been in danger. But every girl knows the importance of a cathartic cry, when you aren't necessarily crying over something specific, but because everything has worked itself into a giant, contorted knot. Anything you want to talk about? Kind of. Not really. I don't know. Can you meet me? Of course. Where are you? She sniffed. I'm still in Schaumburg. I'm at the Goodwins off I-90. I know it's far away, but could you meet me out here? Do you have time? Goodwins was one of those ubiquitous 24-hour restaurants that you saw in office parks and hotel parking lots. The kind frequented by senior citizens at four in the afternoon and teenagers at midnight. I wouldn't call Mallory a foodie, but she definitely had an interest in hip cuisine. If we were meeting at Goodwins, she either wanted bland food or anonymity. I wasn't crazy about either option. I'm just leaving the ombuds office. It'll take me about 45 to get there. 
That okay? Yeah, I'm studying. I'll be here. The studying explained the choice of restaurants. We said our goodbyes, and I looked back at the office door for a minute, wondering if I should head back in and warn Catcher that his girl was a stress ball. But I was a BFF, and there was a code of honor, a protocol. She'd called me, not Catcher, even though he was in the office and clearly reachable. That meant she needed to vent to me, so that was what we'd do. On my way, I muttered and started the car. While I drove, I made plans for the second part of my investigation, and that part was a little bit trickier, mostly because I didn't think my source liked me. The first time we'd met, Jonah had been brusque. The second time, I discovered him on the dark streets of Wrigleyville, having followed me around so he could get a look at me. Test my metal, as it were. The Red Guard had been organized two centuries ago to protect master vampires, but now operated to keep a watchful eye on the masters themselves. When Noah Beck, the leader of Chicago's rogues, made the membership offer, he'd informed me that Jonah, captain of the guards of Chicago's Grey House, would be my partner if I signed up. I was flattered by the offer, but joining a group whose purpose was to keep an eye on the masters would have provoked World War III in Cadogan House. Ethan, if he'd learned of it, would have seen the move as a slap in his face. I considered myself to be a pretty low-drag vampire. Purposely adding to my stockpile of drama wasn't really my cup of tea. Jonah, having been singularly unimpressed with me, probably wasn't bummed that I'd said no. I wasn't expecting this telephone call was going to go any better, but the RG had details on the raves, including the rave they'd cleaned up. And since my visit to the Umbud's office hadn't exactly been productive on an intel-gathering basis, albeit very productive on a river troll diplomacy basis, Jonah was a source I needed to tap. He'd called me once before, so when I was on the move north toward Schaumburg, I dialed his number. He answered after a couple of rings. Jonah. Hi, it's Merritt. There was an awkward pause. House business? I assumed he was asking if I was calling on behalf of Cadogan House, or our RG connection. Not exactly. Do you have a minute to talk? Another pause. Give me five minutes. I'll call you back. The line went dead, so I made sure my ringer was turned on and put the phone in the cup holder while I made my way toward I-90. Jonah was punctual. The dashboard clock had moved ahead exactly five minutes when he called back. I had to get outside, he explained. I'm on the street now. Figured that would avoid the drama. Scott Gray's vampires lived in a converted warehouse in the Andersonville neighborhood, not far from Wrigley Field, the Lucky Ducks. What's up? he asked. I decided to offer up the truth. Mayor Tate called us into his office yesterday, told us he had an eyewitness account that a band of vampires had killed three humans. Damn. His curse was low and a little tired sounding. Anything else? Tate suggested the violence was part of the rave culture, but based on our intel, this sounds different, bigger, meaner. If the witness, a Mr. Jackson, was telling the truth, this has the markings of some kind of attack. That it happened at a rave might be the minor issue. In any event, it's time to do something about them. And in order to do that, I need information. So you called me? I rolled my eyes. The question suggested he was doing me a favor, and that he'd ask for one in return. How very vampire. You're my best hope for answers, I matter-of-factly said. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot to tell you. I know about the last rave, the one the RG cleaned up. But only because Noah filled me in. I wasn't there. Do you think Noah might have any more information? Maybe, but why not just call him directly? Because you were offered up to me as a partner. Jonah paused. Is this call an indication of interest in the RG? It's a last-ditch effort to glean information, I thought, but offered instead. I think this is big enough that it transcends houses or RG membership. Fair enough. I'll ask some questions and get back to you if I learn anything. I assume you won't tell anyone we've talked. 
Your secret is safe with me. And thanks. Don't thank me until I dig something up. I'll be in touch. The line went dead, so I tucked the phone away. There were more drama and complications with each day that passed. Rarely did a night pass without more vampire drama. Sometimes hanging out in pajamas with a good book sounded like a phenomenal idea. The phone rang again almost immediately after I'd hung up. I glanced at the screen. It was my father. I had briefly considered sending him directly to voicemail, but I'd been doing that a lot lately. Enough that my lack of communication hit my grandfather's radar. I didn't want my problems on his plate, so I sucked it up, flipped open the phone, and raised it to my ear. Hello? I'd like to speak with you, my father said, apparently by way of greeting. That was inevitably true. I'm sure my father had a number of topics in the queue for me. The trick was figuring out which particular topic was on his mind today. About? I asked. Some things on the horizon. I've become aware of some investments in which I think Ethan might be interested. Ah, that explained the good humor at Creeley Creek. If there was anything that made my father happy, it was the possibility of a capital gain and a fat commission. Still, I did appreciate that he was interested in working with Ethan, instead of trying to bury us all. We're in the middle of something right now, but I'll definitely advise Ethan of your offer. He can call me in the office, my father said. He meant his skyscraper on Michigan Avenue, across from Millennium Park. Only the best real estate for the city's best real estate mogul. With that bit of instruction, the line went dead. If only we could have picked our family. Chapter 6 Season of the Witch I pulled into the restaurant's almost empty parking lot. The restaurant's windows glowed, only a handful of men and women visible through the glass. I parked the Volvo and headed inside, glancing around until I found Mallory. She sat at a table in front of a laptop computer and a foot-high stack of books, her straight, ice-blue hair tucked behind her ears. She frowned at the screen, a half-full tumbler of orange juice at her side. She glanced up when I came in, and I noticed the dark circles beneath her eyes. Hi, she said, relief in her face. I slid into the booth. You look tired. No need to equivocate when your BFF was in pain, I figured. I am tired. She closed the laptop and slid it out of the way, then linked her hands on the table. Practicum isn't all it's cracked up to be. I crossed my legs on the bench. Hard work? Physically and emotionally exhausting. She frowned over at the pile of books. This is like sorcery boot camp, learning stuff I should have studied ten years ago cramming all that into a few-month period. Is it useful stuff? Yeah, I mean, I've gone over it with my tutor so much, it's kind of second nature now. Before I had time to blink, the plastic salt and pepper shakers were sliding across the table in front of me. I glanced up and found Mallory completely still, her expression bland. I'd seen Mallory move things before, furniture the last time but I hadn't seen her so lackadaisical about it. That's impressive. She shrugged, but there was something dark in her eyes. I can do it almost without thinking about it. And how do you feel about that? That was when the tears began to well. She looked up and away, as if the gesture alone would keep the tears from falling. But they slipped down her cheeks anyway, and when she brushed away the tears, I realized her fingers were red and raw. Talk to me, I told her, then glanced around. Our corner of the restaurant was empty. The only waitress in sight sat at a table on the other side of the room, rolling silverware into paper napkins. It's practically just you and me in here. That unleashed a new flood of tears. My heart clenched at the thought that she'd done or seen things in the last couple of weeks that had brought her to tears, and that I probably couldn't have stopped it. I got up and moved to her side of the table, waiting until she slid down before I took a seat beside her. Tell me, I said. I don't know who I am anymore. I couldn't help it. I smiled. 
If there was ever a problem I could understand as a newbie vampire, that was it. I bumped my forehead against her shoulder. Keep going. The floodgates opened. I was this girl, right? Doing my thing. Having blue hair, working my ad exec mojo. And then you're a vampire, and Ethan Sullivan is touching my hair and telling me I have magic. And then there's Catcher, and I'm a witch, and I'm learning keys and how to throw flaming balls of crap at targets so I'm ready when the vampire shit inevitably hits the fan. She sucked in air, then started again. I was supposed to be a partner at 30 merit. Have a condo on the lake. Have a Birkin bag and generally be satisfied with my very fancy lot. And now I'm doing... She looked around. Magic. And not just magic. Another tear slid down her cheek. What do you mean, not just magic? Her voice dropped an octave. You know about the four keys, right? Sure. Power, beings, weapons, text. Right. Those are the four major divisions of magic. Well, it turns out it's not that simple. Those aren't the only major divisions. I frowned at her. So what are the others? She leaned in toward me. Their black magic merit. The bad stuff. There's an entire system of dark magic that overlays the four good keys. She grabbed a napkin and uncapped a pen. You've seen Catcher's tattoo, right? I nodded. It was across his abdomen, a circle divided into quadrants. She sketched out the image I'd seen, then pointed at the four pie-like segments. So each quadrant is a key, right? A division of magic. She pulled another napkin from the holder and unfolded it, then drew another divided circle. When she was done, she placed the second napkin on top of the first one. It's the same four divisions, but all black magic. This time, my voice was softer. Give me something to go on here. What kind of black magic are we talking? Elphaba? Wicked Witch of the West type stuff? Or Slytherin type stuff? She shook her head. I can't tell you. You can tell me anything. She looked over at me, frustration clear in her face. Not won't tell you. Can't tell you. There's Order Juju at work. I know things, but I can't get them out. I can summon up the phrases in my head, but can't actually give voice to the words. I did not like the sound of that, the fact that the already secretive order was using magic to keep Mallory from talking about the things that worried her. Dark things. Regrettable things? Is there anything I can do? She shook her head, eyes on her hands on the table. Is that why your hands are so chapped? She nodded. I'm tired, Merritt. I'm training, and I'm learning what I can, but this... I don't know. It uses you differently. She clenched her hands into fists and then released them again. It's a whole different kind of exhausting. Not just body, not just mind. Soul, too, kind of. Her eyebrows nodded with worry. Have you talked to Catcher about any of this? She shook her head. He's not in the order. I can't tell him anything I can't tell you. I suddenly had an understanding of why Catcher wasn't such a big fan of the order, and why it mattered whether he was still a member or not. How can I help? She swallowed. Could we just sit here for a little while? She sighed haggardly. I'm just tired, and I have exams coming up and there's so much prep to do, so many expectations on me right now. I just don't want to go home, not back to my life. I just want to sit in this crappy corporate restaurant for another couple of hours. I put my arm around her shoulders. As long as you want. We sat in the booth for an hour, barely talking, Mallory sipping orange juice from her cup and staring out the window at the rare car that passed the restaurant. When her tumbler was empty, I bumped her shoulder again. He loves you, you know. Even if it feels like something you can't take to him, you can. I mean, I get that you can't give him the details, but you can tell him this is worrying you. You know that for sure? I caught the tiny thread of hope in her voice and tugged. I know that for sure. It's Catcher, Mallory. Crazy stubborn, 
Sure, gruff, absolutely, but also totally in love with you. She sniffed. Keep going. Remember what you told me about Ethan? That I deserve someone who wanted me from the beginning. Well, Catcher Bell is your somebody. He would snap anyone who came at you in half, and that's been obvious since the second he met you. There's not a doubt in my mind that he's all in, and there's nothing you can't tell him. Well, I added with a smile, unless you become a vamp, that would probably be a deal breaker. Mal made a half laugh, half cry, and wiped her face again. I assume you're not making secret plans to become a vampire. Not right at this moment. Good. I think one vamp in the family is plenty enough. I concur on that one. It's just. She paused, then started again. There are very few decisions in my life that I regret. Not grabbing that vintage Chanel we saw at the consignment store on Division. Not watching Buffy until the third season. Minor stuff, but you know what I mean. She shook her head. But this, being ID'd as a sorcerer, agreeing to go along with this stuff, taking part in things—I don't know. Maybe I should have just ignored the whole thing, kept on with the ad gig, and ignored the vampires and the sorcery and Ethan touching my hair. I mean, who does that? Who touches someone's hair and then pronounces they have magic? Darth Sullivan. Darth Goddamn Sullivan. She chuckled a little, then put her head on my shoulder. Did you ever wish you could just walk away, rewind your life back to the day before you became supernaturally inclined, and catch an Amtrak out of town? I smiled a little, thinking of what Ethan had said. The thought has occurred to me. All right, she said, putting her palms flat on the table and blowing out a breath. It's time for a pep talk. Ready, set, go. That was my cue to call Adult Swim at the pity pool and kick her out, and then offer up a little motivational magic of my own. Mallory Carmichael, you're a sorceress. You may not like it, but it's a fact. You have a gift, and you're not going to sit around at Goodwin's drinking fifty-nine cent coffee because you've got concerns about your assignments. You're a sorceress, but you're not a robot. If you have concerns about your job, talk to someone about it. If you think something you're doing flunks the smell test, then stop doing it. Break the chain of command if that's what it takes. You have a conscience and you know how to use it. We sat quietly there for a moment until her decisive nod. That's what I needed. That's why you love me. Well, that and we wear the same shoe size. She swiveled in her seat and pulled up a knee. Her foot. Now propped on the seat was snug inside a pair of lime green limited edition Pumas, one of the pair I'd left at Mal's house when I'd moved into Cadogan. Are those what they are? Is so comfy, Mallory Delancey Carmichael. Hey, Street Fest is this weekend. She suddenly said, "Maybe we could head down and nosh some meat on a stick." Street Fest was Chicago's annual end of summer food bash. Restaurants and caterers put up their white vinyl tents in Grant Park to hawk their wares and celebrate the end of August's roasting heat and steamy humidity. Normally, I was a pretty big fan. Sampling Chicago's finest grub while listening to live music wasn't exactly a bad way to spend an evening. On the other hand, are you trying to distract me with roast beast? She batted her eyelashes. Seriously, Mallory. Those shoes are limited edition. Do you remember how long I tried to find them? We staked out the web for like three weeks. Epistemological crisis here, Mayor. Seriously, one cannot tread lightly in cheap knockoff sneaks when one is enmeshed in a crisis. I sighed, knowing I'd been beaten. As it turned out, she didn't have two hours in her. She needed only twenty more minutes before she was ready to return to her life, to keys and magic and catcher. She decided to make an early night of practicum, and instead put in a call to catcher that was sickly sweet enough that my blood sugar rose. But however sickening, she was smiling by the end of the call, so I had to give props to catcher. We exchanged hugs in the parking lot, and I sent her home to Wicker Park and the waiting arms of a green-eyed sorcerer.
Whatever worked. Ironic, I guess, that I was heading back to the house of a green-eyed vampire, although definitely not to his chagrin, his waiting arms. I was nearly back in that vampire's territory when my phone rang again. Merit, I answered. Something's going on tonight, Jonas said. A rave? Might start out that way, but if these things really are as violent as you're hearing... He didn't need to finish the sentence, unfortunately. The implication was obvious and bad. How did you find out? Text message, a flash mob, just like the others. And this time we got in early enough, I wondered aloud. This time we got lucky and found the phone, Jonas said. Someone left it at Benson's. Benson's, as in across the street from Wrigley Field Benson's? Yeah, that's the Grey House Bar. One of the many bars around the stadium that had installed bleachers on its roof. Benson's was, in my opinion, the best spot in town to get a view of Wrigley Field without a ticket. Kudos on that one, I said. I've spent many a fine evening in Benson's. And so you were in the company of vampires before you were even aware of them, he said. How ironic. I couldn't help but chuckle. He might be pretentious, but Jonah apparently had a sense of humor as well. Anyway, I had the phone in my office, and we didn't think much of it until we got the text. Same format, same message as the others. Is the phone useful? Can we trace the number or something? The phone was a disposable, and it hadn't been in use long. The outgoing calls were all to businesses that don't keep track of customer calls. The only incoming was the text. We called the number back, and it's already been disconnected. We haven't been able to find any other information. Ah, but they didn't have a Jeff Christopher. Can you give me the number? I've got a friend with some computer skills. Wouldn't hurt to have him look at it. Jonah read me the digits. I grabbed an envelope and a pen from the glove box and wrote it down, making a mental note to send it to Jeff later. So where's the rave? A penthouse in Streeterville. Streeterville was the part of downtown Chicago that stretched from Michigan Avenue to the lake. Lots of skyscrapers, lots of money, and lots of tourists. I'm not crazy about the idea of raving vampires in Streeterville. Although that would make a good horror flick title. Vampires in Streeterville, I mean. A second joke in a matter of minutes. I'm glad to know you have a sense of humor. I'm a vampire, not a zombie. Good to know. If you're in, meet me at the water tower, two o'clock. I checked the dashboard clock. It was barely past midnight, which gave me just enough time to get back to the house, change clothes, and head out again. I'll be there, I assured him. Weapon-wise, what should I bring? Sword or hidden dagger? I'm surprised at you, Sentinel. Vampires generally don't use hidden blades. He was right. Hidden blades were considered a dishonorable way to fight. I heard the question in his voice. Are you an honorable soldier? Admittedly, carrying a hidden blade didn't pass the smell test I just told Mallory to use. But what could I do? The hidden blade taboo was made before Selena got a wild hair and decided to out us to the world. I can fight without steel if necessary, but I'd prefer to have backup. I think I'd proven that point pretty well last night. And to think, only a few months ago, I'd been a graduate student in English Lit. Go figure. Well put. A thought occurred to me. I can't tell Ethan I'm visiting a rave alone, and I certainly can't tell him I'm going with you if you want to keep your RG membership a secret. Maybe you should substitute Noah in the version you tell Ethan. Since Noah was the de facto leader of Chicago's rogue vampires, that made sense. Of course, I'd still have to lie to Ethan. I wasn't crazy about that idea, but it wasn't fair to rely on Jonah and his intel and then out his RG membership. Probably a good idea, I concluded. I'll give Noah a call and fill him in, Jonah said. I'll see you tonight. Call me if you need anything. I said my temporary goodbyes, sincerely hoping I could make it through the next few hours before meeting Jonah without having to call him for help. Of course, even if I wasn't calling a vampire for help, I still had to ask a vampire for permission. The food truck was gone when I returned to the house, and the humans looked tired again. 
Ethan probably hadn't counted on the truck's second benefit, the post-hot beef food coma. I walked past the protesters with a friendly smile and wave, then trotted into the house and headed for Ethan's first-floor office. I found the door open, the office abuzz with activity. Helen, the house liaison for newbie vamps, stood in the middle of the room, pink binder in hand, directing the flow of sleek new furniture into Ethan's office. The room had been mostly emptied after the attack, the bulk of his furniture reduced to matchsticks. But that was being remedied by the men and women, presumably vampires, given Tate's human-free house policy, who were carrying in pieces of a gigantic new conference table. Another vampire I didn't recognize flitted around, offering suggestions to the movers about furniture placement. Since she wore a nubby pink suit that exactly matched Helen's, I assumed she was Helen's assistant. Ethan sat behind a new desk, his chair pushed back. One ankle crossed over one knee, his gaze on Helen. He watched the two of them work with a mix of amusement and irritation in his expression. I walked over and noticed the spread of glossy paper on his desk, home decor catalogs, catering menus, lighting plans. What's going on? We're preparing. Hands behind my back, I glanced down at one of the catering menus. For senior prom? Let me guess. A night under the stars is your theme. Ethan glanced up at me, a line between his eyes. For the imminent arrival of Darius West. That floored me. Darius West was the head of the Greenwich Presidium. Since the GP was headquartered near London, I couldn't imagine Darius's arrival in Chicago pretended anything good. That took care of convincing Ethan not to join me and Jonah at the rave tonight. Darius gave me a perfect excuse to keep Jonah in the closet. But that didn't mean I wouldn't take the opportunity to tweak Ethan. Yet another surprise visit to Cadogan House? He kept his voice low. As we've discussed, Lacey's visit wasn't a surprise, although it was somewhat accelerated. He looked up at me. And as we've also discussed, you're the only one I'm interested in. I wasn't up for this conversation in an empty room, much less a room full of vampires, so I changed the subject. When will our esteemed leader be here? Evidently in two hours. I blinked, shocked Ethan wouldn't get a little more advance notice for the arrival of a man we had to call Sire. And you're just discovering this now? Ethan wet his lips, irritation crossing his face. Darius apparently believed it would be best if he visited the house en naturel, so to speak. No warning meant no time to fake conditions in the house, or some such concern. He wants to see us in our typical home environment. Being the knuckle-draggers we usually are. He smiled thinly. As you say, he's on a plane, has been since before sunset, and will be here relatively shortly. Helen is preparing an evening meal. There are traditions that must be followed. Virgin sacrifice? The finest corn-fed Midwestern beef, in copious amounts for Darius and his entourage. That word tightened my stomach. When you say entourage, I'm not including Selena. He won't be bringing any other GP members, just his usual traveling staff. He's already got an advance man in Chicago. They'll be staying at the Trump. I'm surprised he's not staying here if he wants to keep an eye on things. Ethan scoffed. The largest room we have available is the consort suite, and Darius's taste runs to something larger and more refined. I hadn't developed much respect for the GP in the relatively few months I'd been a vampire. This info wasn't doing much for my impression of Darius West, either. Now that he'd explained the furniture shenanigans, it was time to give Ethan a second dose of fun news. I gestured toward Helen and her helpers. Can I speak to you privately? To discuss? House business. He glanced up, meeting my gaze for a moment while gauging my request. Helen, he said, his eyes still on me. Could you give us a moment? Of course. With a smile, she closed her binder. With a twirl of her hand, she rounded up her assistant and the movers. 
You have the floor, he said when the office door closed behind them. First matter of business, my father wants to involve you in some kind of investment. Feel free to call him back or not. I only promised that I'd tell you about it. Ethan rolled his eyes. That explains his chipperness at Creeley Creek. My thoughts exactly. As for the other Creeley Creek business, I visited the ombudsman's office. They haven't heard any chatter about violent episodes. I steeled my will and offered up the lie I'd prepared. Since we have suspected the raves are operated by rogues, I called Noah. Ethan paused, probably debating whether it was worth the trouble to scold me for making a call to the leader of the rogue vampires without his permission. But after a moment, he relented. Good thinking. It was a lie, is what it was, and that did not sit well in my stomach or heart, but it had to be done. He called a few minutes ago, I added. He was flash-mobbed a time and place for some sort of event tonight. A rave? I shrugged. He doesn't know. He only got a time and place. A high-rent place in Streeterville. 2 a.m. Ethan pushed back his shirt sleeve and glanced down at his watch. Uh, that's not much time. And with Darius coming in, I can't go. And I can't spare any guards. I know. Noah volunteered to go with me. Ethan watched me for a minute. We'd usually, by circumstance, ended up on our various adventures together. This would be a first for me, an escapade with another vampire. I'm not crazy about this idea, he said. If Tate's information is correct, we're looking at something bigger and nastier than raves. Maybe something the raves are evolving into. We have to figure out what it is. If we don't, you'll be wearing an orange jumpsuit. I know. He picked up a black pencil and tapped it absently on the desk before gazing up at me with translucently green eyes. You'll be careful. I have no interest in ending up on the wrong end of an aspen stake, I promised. And besides, I took two oaths to serve your house. It wouldn't exactly be kosher of me to skip out just because I was afraid. His expression softened sympathetically. Are you? I prefer to avoid violence. I know the feeling. At the sudden knock on the door, we both looked up. Two vamps, unescorted by Helen, stood in the doorway, sharing the weight of a massive marble pedestal. I glanced at Ethan, eyebrow lifted. It belonged to Peter Cadogan, he dryly explained. We've had it in storage, but Helen thought it would add verve to the room. Far be it for me to disagree. We can move this in, one of the vamps asked. Ethan waved them in. Of course, thank you. As they scurried across the floor, marble in hand, he glanced back at me. Good luck tonight. Report when you're back. With that, he looked down at his papers, excusing me from his office. It took me a moment to turn around and head for the door again. It was not that I'd expected a teary goodbye, but we had become de facto partners. I could understand his reticence to talk about raves in front of the other vamps, but a few words of wisdom wouldn't have been amiss. I might have been a soldier, but I was still a newbie one, and even vampire soldiers were occasionally frightened. As much as I loved casual and as steamy as August had been so far, I knew jeans and a cotton tank top weren't going to cut it tonight. We were heading to a rave. At best, it was going to be a party for vamps. I needed to look the part. At worst, it was going to be a battle of vamps, and I was going to need the protection. No, tonight was a night for leather. Well, leather pants, at least, since it was much too hot for the full ensemble. I know, stereotypical vampire. I had that thought every time I pulled the leather out of my closet. But you ask any Harley rider who's experienced road rash, and he'll explain why he wears leather, because it works. Steel can slice, and bullets can pierce. Leather makes those things a little harder to get through. I pulled a longish, flowy, gray tank top from the closet and paired that with the leather pants, then pulled my hair into a high ponytail, leaving a fringe of bangs across my forehead. I skipped the Cadogan medal. I was attempting to fly undercover, after all. But I pulled a long necklace made of strands of pewter-colored beads over the tank. 
With my black boots, the ensemble looked half-runway, half-party girl. It didn't scream vampire soldier, which I figured could only help. Element of surprise and all that. I slid my dagger, inscribed on one end with my position, into my right boot, then stuck my phone and beeper into a tiny clutch purse. I wouldn't take the purse or the beeper to the event, but at least I wouldn't have to carry a handful of gadgets to the car. En masse, they weren't exactly ergonomic. I just added blush and lip gloss when there was a knock at the door. Luke, I assumed, having been sent upstairs by Ethan for a last-minute strategy session. About time, I said, pulling the door open. Green eyes stared back at me. Ethan hadn't sent Luke upstairs. He'd come on his own. He scanned my outfit. Date night? I'm trying to fit in with the rest of the party-goers, I reminded him. So I see. You've got weapons? A dagger in my boot. Anything else would be too obvious. The emotion was clear in his eyes. But I needed to stay focused. I kept my voice neutral, my words careful. I'll be safe, and Noah will have my back. Ethan nodded. I've updated Luke. The guards are all on standby. If you call, they come running, immediately. If you need anything, you call one of them. If anything happens to you— I'm immortal, I interrupted, reminding him of the biological clock he'd stopped from ticking. And I have no interest in taking liberties with my immortality. He nodded, regret in his eyes. That look made it seem like he was seeking a discussion between two lovers, not between boss and employee. Maybe he did have feelings for me, real ones, unbound by obligation or position. But even if I was interested in pursuing that lead, now was not the time. I had a task to perform. But before I could remind him of that and send him on his way, he cupped my face in his hands. You will be careful. It was an order that brooked no argument. That was convenient, since words failed me. You will be careful, he repeated, and you will stay in touch with me, Luke, or Catcher. Darius will be here, so Malik and I may be indisposed. Get in contact with whomever you can. Take no unnecessary risks. I promise I wasn't planning on it. Not because you asked me to, I hastily added, but because I like being alive. He clearly wasn't dissuaded and stroked my jawline with his thumb. You can run. You can keep running to the ends of the earth. But I won't be far behind you. Ethan, no, I will never be far behind you. He tipped up my chin so that I could do nothing else but look back into his eyes. Do the things you need to do. Learn to be a vampire, to be a warrior, to be the soldier you are capable of being. But consider the possibility that I made a mistake I regret and that I'll continue to regret that mistake and try to convince you to give me another chance until the earth stops turning. He leaned forward and pressed his lips to my forehead, my heart melting even as my more rational side harbored suspicions. No one said love was easy, Sentinel. And then he was gone, and the door was closed again, leaving me standing there, dumbfounded, staring at it. What was I supposed to do with that? Chapter 7. More Human Than Human The Chicago water tower sat like a wedding cake topper in the middle of Magnificent Mile. It had survived the Great Fire, and now it served as a symbol of the city and a background for tourist photographs. Jonah leaned against the stone railing beside the steps into the building in trim jeans and a silvery button-up, his gaze on the phone in his hands. His hair was loose around a face that might have been carved by Michelangelo himself, if Michelangelo had sculpted a man who had looked like an Irish god. Perfect cheekbones, thin nose, square jaw, and long almond-shaped blue eyes framed by locks of his auburn hair. Yes, Jonah was plenty handsome, even with the dour expression that marred his face when he looked up. He tucked the phone into a pocket and moved closer. I watched him look me over, taking in the leather and debating whether I'd be a help or a hindrance on this particular escapade. You're early, he said. I reminded myself to pick my battles. 
I prefer early to late. I thought we might want to talk strategy before we go in. He gestured down Michigan toward the river. Let's walk and talk. And so we started down Michigan Avenue. Two tall and well-dressed vampires. Probably looking like we were on a date instead of planning to infiltrate a vampire blood orgy. And we looked normal enough, apparently, that no one made us out as vamps.